government's total outstanding debt climbs to a new record high in what is now known as Bloody Sunday. Minimum wage is no longer appropriate. Ang ban sa pagbibigay ng bagong permit sa mga minahan. Bumaba ng 4.2% ang gross domestic product. Sa ikalawang araw ng panimigay na ayuda, mahaba pa rin ang pila. This is among the least resilient economies worldwide amid the pandemic. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mid-Year 2021 Ibon Bird Talk, which is a biannual forum we have been holding since about the early 1980s. Ibon was established in 1978. Ibon presents in the Bird Talk the economic and political trends assessment and prospects. Before the pandemic, we would hold this physically or face-to-face -face with about 150 to 400 live audience. We even innovated this from the usual briefing format to TED Talk type, then to talk show type, to make it livelier. Hindi naman natin akalain that now we would be online talking in front of the computer. At any rate, let's make this a fruitful afternoon. I am Rose Biguzman, the head of research. I'm with our executive director, Sunny Africa. Good afternoon, Sunny. Sunny, it's incredible, no? Um, that the country remains in various shades of community quarantine and lockdown in one and a half years already. Sinasabi ng iba, without a doubt, the government bungled its COVID response. When it keeps on saying, it is the pandemic, it is the pandemic, for me, that's becoming to be the biggest lie of the administration. When in reality, it is kapalpakan, why we cannot lower our COVID positivity rate. Simple lang, we are not that. It is kapalpakan, why we still need to wear face shield, even if government officials cannot seem to agree on its necessity. Kapalpakan then, why we still have to write down on a piece of paper and drop it in a box na parang may parakol, which government calls contact tracing. And now we're looking at the uh, the vaccination program, mukhang matatapos tayo, 2023 pa, when more and deadlier mutants have already emerged. Hindi ko makakalimutan, mapapatawad yung the Department of Health refused to impose travel ban daw kasi hindi naman tayo tatamaan ng pandemia because our health system is strong. First off, reactions. No, our public health system has been weakened by privatization and corporatization and government neglect. Yung second reaction ko, which made me really doubt if the Duterte government ever has men and women of science in the cabinet, the government has practically failed to define what a pandemic is. What happened from the start is a militarist response. The government even assigned former military generals in key positions for pandemic response. Not that it hasn't positioned military men in the bureaucracy yet before the pandemic, pero you have the head of the national vaccination program a former military general the head of the national health insurance corporation is a former military general yung skill sets nila are for something else not for a health crisis such as what we are having right now e kung yung secretary na doktor nga hindi na alam ang gagawin eh. so the government over relied on militarist lockdowns without strengthening the health system Ngayon, it's still kapalpakan that causes the economy to collapse, the worst contraction and the highest unemployment rate in Southeast Asia, backed by the smallest um, COVID fiscal response as percent of GDP. And then here comes again the mantra, it is the pandemic, it is the pandemic, it is a pandemic. An oft-repeated lie becomes the truth. But you know what? It is not even repeating the lie that makes things worse. It is telling one lie after another. At one point, the kakaroon ng negation, eh, no? For instance, the economic managers are saying, yes, it is the pandemic that has caused the economy to have the worst contraction in recorded history. But, sabi nila, unlike past crises, the Philippine economy has solid fundamentals to address the crisis. What an outright lie, no? Alam mo, may natutunan akong word ngayon, Sunny. Mythomania, I love it. It's the scientific term for pathological lying. Sunny, for you, what is the biggest lie of the administration? Biggest, ah? Huh? We don't have much time. 
<laughs> last few years have been really about you know superlatives uh, in terms of the COVID response, in terms of where we're at. I think the biggest lie, which is promoted so strongly by the administration through its disinformation, is that it cares for the people. Um, but you know, I think in so many ways, a president who's um, not truthful about his family's wealth, hiding his sounds. You have a president who's not truthful, of, truthful about his own state of wealth. Mm. You know, for them to say that this is a government that cares for the people, even worse, this is the only kind of government that can, um, you know, um, lift us up from the miseries of the nation. And, you know, hiding how it's the source of all the miseries of the nation in terms of its economic policies, its COVID response, even the erosion of democracy. I think that's a huge lie. At para sabi mo nga, if it's repeated often enough, will people believe it? Well, ako, I believe not. And I think that's why the government is so afraid of the truth. So mm-hmm. I, I think I'm looking forward to our discussion and well, more people talking about more things even beyond our little forum. No, nga. that's true. Oh, ito na lang. Um, not a lie, but really some some ano, fantastic ano, ano. ambition 2040. <laughs> Sabi niya, extreme poverty is eradicated by 2020. Measured in an increase of per capita gross national income, GNI daw, from what used to be 3,500 US dollars to at least 12,376 US dollars, that's roughly 50,000 a month na, per capita. Sabi niya, this is in relation to achieving high income status where Japan and South Korea are today. By 2022, Sunny, that's by next year. Let's comment on that. What's your take on that? Ah, well, ambition 24 years, ambitious, and um, But the thing is, it's an end. Eh? I mean, it just summarizes what people want. People want a more comfortable life. People want um, to improve their welfare. Of course, people want an end to poverty. So, parang as a statement of ends, I mean, it's it's uncontroversial. I think the problem is, if the government says that it wants to achieve these things, the big question is, what is it doing to get there? And I think that's where um, the problem lies. You know, we can all have our own ambitions and perspectives about ourselves, our nation. But if we're not doing what we need to be doing to achieve that, and if worse, if we're actually being counterproductive and moving further away from that, I think that's where the problem lies. So I have no major issues with, you know, being ambitious about the development ends we want. But if the means we're taking are counterproductive and destructive, and if that counterproductivity and destructiveness is covered up with mistruths, untruths, disinformation, I think that's a serious problem that we, we have been having for the past few years. And you know, God forbid, um, we might have for the coming years as well after the elections. Alamod, um, they're saying 2022, extreme poverty eradication is achievable. Because we've already lifted 6 million Filipinos out of poverty now in 2018. That was, that's been achieved in 2018. Well, we keep on saying, oh, yeah, that's uh, on the basis of 71 pesos a day. But actually, uh, we have also observed that the administration has poured in so much uh, conditional or cash transfers, no? Para ma lift niyan from the 6 million. Pero still, and dami pa rin na iiwan, no? Living in extreme poverty. Um, Sunny, in the, in the tech, I, I know there is a slide showing, for example, that hindi rin achievable yung uh, per capita GNI that they want because the trend right now even before the pandemic is that the per capita GDP is going down can you um, comment on that ito yun na no uh, why actually this is quite an important slide eh, to say you know you opening mo what are the big lies there's a big lie and there are lots of little lies supporting that and i think one of the little lies it's also big but not as big as the big lie um, the, the ship was sinking even before the pandemic hit. Uh, you know, the, when, when the pandemic iceberg came around, the government wants to say that things were, you know, we're doing very well, there was momentum, we were strong coming to the pandemic. Actually, that, that graph, I think, is so important because it summarizes where we were even before the pandemic. And it's quite clear. Every single year since the start of the Duterte administration, um, the economy has been slowing down. And the income, average income, supposedly as measured by 
GDP per capita has also been falling. And I think that's so critical because when we're talking about being strong before the pandemic hitting, it means one, strong in terms of growth momentum, which we didn't have. It means strong in terms of job creation, which actually was weakening in during the Duterte administration compared to the past administration. Um, and we have to add to that, the quality of jobs is actually much worse. So we, we not only had disguised high unemployment, we actually had worsening informality, uh, meaning really bad quality of jobs. And even that poverty reduction, it's artificial eh? because poverty is reduced in an economy by an economy that creates jobs and increases incomes. But the only reason that that illusory poverty reduction was achieved was through cash transfers. And of course, there's nothing wrong with increasing your four-piece budget to give more cash transfers to the poor. But the thing is, that's artificial because in the end, if you're not creating enough jobs for the poorest Filipinos, if you're not raising their incomes from the jobs they have, you're actually just covering up for an economy, which is I think the worst thing about the economy right now. There's no trickle down, seriously. What we have is a gushing up of wealth and income in the country. And I think that's that's really where, where a problem lies. It's like very deep structural problems of the economy failing, agriculture weakening, Filipino industry in decline. If those aren't resolved, we will actually not be able to achieve even those grand ambition 2040 targets. And even worse, we're going to be covering up for, you know, at a really distorted economy where, where we're not getting the development outcomes we want. Mm. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, the narrative of the, the economic managers, ibang iba eh sa sinasabi mo. Because uh, it's also maybe because we define fundamentals differently, you know. They, sa kanila, fundamentals, ay, um, they have macroeconomic management in terms of continuing neoliberal policies in trade and in fast fiscal and even in investment policies. Kung hindi man, I, of course, to even ease no, investment rules. Uh, sabi nila, they, they also have done uh, tax reform very well. I think that's also, yan yung ano, eh, mga <laughs> iiwan talaga, sa, tatatak talaga sa atin no, dito sa administration na ito is we have the most uh, regressive and most anti-poor tax reform in, in, in our history. And um, they ho have also eased down doing business. Infrastructure spending is highest in, 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 in um, across decades in administration. So, yung rural development, mini measure nila. We have liberalized the country's staple, yung rice. And then social protection, we're doing the national ID system. Tapos, when you look at health, they're, they're so proud about universal health care, no? Actually, pwede natin isa-isahin yan. Maybe if we have time to talk about that, but maybe it is a waste of our time, knowing that from the beginning, it is the continuation no, of uh, neoliberal policies. If I remember, right, day one, kauupo niya, we said, oh, ito yung ano mo, uh, ten-point agenda mo, eh, wala namang pinagbago. First word pa lang dun sa macroeconomic policies, ay sinabi na niya, continue. <laughs> so, you know, that the change is coming apart has really ended on day one. Pero ang tanong ko, if we had really had solid fundamentals, why is the government having such a hard time dealing with the pandemic? Ah, well, I think, syempre, it's useful to put some figures on some sound fundamentals we had. Um, I think the slowing growth is a good general indicator of how bad the economy was, was doing before the pandemic. But also, let's not forget, in 2019, before even the pandemic hit, we actually had record unemployment. Um, the government only officially reported about 2.3 million um, unemployed in um, in 2019. But in the re in reality, if you correct for you know this weird change in methodology that prevents comparability with previous years, we actually had close to 4.7 million unemployed in 2019. On top of that, um, 5.8 million underemployed. Because even among those employed, I think it's so critical to accept that the government has to accept there were at least 30, 31 million in the informal sector. So that's, you're talking about basically huge unemployment, in reality about 4.7 million unemployed. And even among those employed, about 70%, about 30, 31 million, were actually in the informal sector, meaning very uncertain jobs nila. And those are very weak fundamentals when the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, you basically stop people from going to work. And the worst affected are those who had shaky work to begin with. So really the worst in the pandemic was this huge informal sector, more or less 
70% of the labor force should be considered in the informal sector. They're the ones who had their, all their um, livelihoods interrupted, their savings wiped out. So if you fast forward to um, where we are right now in, um, where are we now? Well, we're in, well, we're in July, but um, if you look to May 2021, um, unemployment has increased. Um, and again, by our own estimates in Ebon, the government says there are 3.7 million unemployed. But again, if you correct for the um, for those they drop from the labor force because of change in methodology, the real level of unemployed right now should be about 6 million. Underemployment is about 5.5 million. But then again, even that underemployment thing doesn't capture the reality in the last year and a half, well, more or less since um, the start of the pandemic, you have increasing um, informal workers, uh, increasing part-time work. On the other hand, you have decreasing um, informal, uh, sorry, decreasing wage and salary workers and decreasing um, full-time workers. So basically what you have, what we have right now is people struggling to stay afloat, struggling to survive. Yung, yung, ano pa, intern, tawagan natin, madumin discarte lamang. So when the government mm -hmm. brags about there are 2.2 million more employed now compared to, um, compared to January 2020. The reality is actually it's there. You actually have job generation, not in decent work, but you have people finding whatever means they can to make a living, bloating that informality that was already there in, in 2019. So parang, of course the government's going to be struggling to deal with the economic impact of the pandemic because yeah, we were weak coming into it. But what actually makes it worse, they're choosing not to deal with the pandemic. I think that's the most important thing to grasp in terms of the economy right now. Um, you know, mo, hindi na yung proper containment. You know, you know, foundation, what's the original sin? Um, if you don't deal with, you don't contain the pandemic, you can't open the economy. But actually, even in economic terms, they're not spending. Um, the, the, the government um, budget increases this last year and this year. They're even less than in 2017, 2018. So there was no stimulus to speak of. So nag-lockdown ka na, we nasa ko yung ng million-million Pilipino, but you're not compensating by increasing their demand, putting money in their pockets. So you're creating this vicious cycle. My first my first round of problems ka, like harsh lockdown in March last year, people go, couldn't go to work. But by, even by the time that you were opening up, that was too late because businesses had closed, people had lost their savings, their incomes fell. So now we're stuck in a low aggregate demand trap, which the government is not doing anything anything to fix. And if they're saying that, it's crazy. I just heard yesterday the DBCC affirmed their um, super over-optimistic um, growth estimates for this year and next year. But I'm so oblivious to the fact that 10% of MSMEs have shut down. They're oblivious to the fact that um, about two and a half million Filipinos have lost their savings. About, I think, about 70% of Filipinos right now don't have any savings to speak of. And then, if, if you're not acknowledging the economic scarring you've caused, if you're not acknowledging that your headline solution of vaccination is dragging, it doesn't make sense na, you know, you're, you're throwing out these huge um, growth estimates, I think 6 to 7% for 2021. Mm -hmm. It's coming from nowhere. And I think, I mean, it's part of the untruth administration. So in, in maybe in previous times, you make growth targets projections because it's based on science. Now it's based on propaganda. The government's going to admit it's doing such a bad job. But instead of improving what they're doing, it's like with all these fantastic targets, which aren't going to happen. And I, I think that's, uh, that's a starting point of, fixing the problem. You have to acknowledge the problem. And I may ask solution afterwards. Um, okay, going back to the macro economy, because um ipinakita natin eh, no, na the, the one reason kung bakit, uh, the government is having such a hard time is that um, it does not acknowledge ko ano yung problema talaga. Ibig sabihin, ano yung fundamental for, for us the fundamental uh, uh, problem with the economy is that it cannot create jobs. Tapos it's been slowing down, and now it, it really it it um it ruined. No, kung baga inano niya ka sinira niya, winasak niya lahat all the jobs, and th there are so much jobs lost. Even if uh, the government uh, shifts from quarterly <laughs> counting to monthly counting, 
ano talaga eh, it remains na we have more uh, jobless now than in January 2020. But anyway, going back to the macroeconomy, which you've meant... Okay, go ahead. Actually, it's good the government is starting to count uh, um, the, the, the job situation and do the labor force survey every month. So in principle, that's a good thing. But the thing is, if the methodology for counting jobs is inaccurate, actually what that monthly counting is doing, it's actually being used to cover up the fact that jobs are declining. And I think that's, that's, that's parang one step forward, two steps back. Eh? Because parang, um, what you care for, you have to count talaga. So the question is, why is the government counting poverty and incomes on a monthly basis? Why is the government counting um, how much wealth is being destroyed or has never been existing for the poorest Filipinos? Parang, if you're going to be using labor force figures para mapabango yung ginagawa mo without clarifying that these labor force figures are inaccurate because they disguise high unemployment and they actually don't really directly address the problem of worsening informality. Actually, even that monthly count is in a way part of this whole um, infrastructure of untools we have. Eh. So, sorry, oh, kailangan ko sumingit kasi that's so important right yeah, now. Eh. Fun changing the... Exactly. But you know, you know what? Ako medyo, ayo, ano, I'm, I'm really against going monthly. Kasi it, ano, it, it perpetuates or it supports yung reality that jobs, the formality of jobs cannot go beyond on a monthly basis. Kaya nga, dapat kaya pag quarterly o kaya sana every six months, it's because there's an assumption in the economy that the jobs you find and the jobs you create are regular and permanent. So let's count it again after six months. I mean, of course, there will be probation, etc. Pero ngayon, every month, minibilang mo siya, which is a waste of time if you are not incorporating in your policies yung pag-alis uh, um, pag ng contractualization and even regularizing um, not only the jobs created, but yung mismong nakakuha ng jobs na yun. But anyway, I do agree na yung, uh, an anong term mo? Parang... Parang hindi, hindi pa ka the narrative eh. You're just, you're, you're talking about something, tapos gusto mo siyang i-distract. So, you know what? You'll tell another story and use another methodology. And and um, previously, hindi pa rin nako-correct when they did not count the discouraged workers. But now they're counting something else and comparing it to the previous month. Ganun na lang yung ano, no, itsura. So, we cannot make long-term um, policies or kumbaga long term um, laws for lab labor laws na beneficial to the workers uh, just because um, yung ating uh, pagtingin sa kanya is napaka short term na no? yung ganun yung ginagawa ng government but anyway going back to the macro economy you mentioned about um, to begin with kahit bago mag pandemia we were really having a hard time already you know? the economy was slowing down i would just like to mention na yung even yung mga inasahan din no, ng government that would boost its um, its shallow <laughs> tinatawag niyang fundamentals pero actually just relying on for example OFW remittances um, OFW remittances have been drastically slowing down since 2009 during the global financial crisis we used to have double um, digit growth rates pero nagkaroon na ng uh, single digit and in fact the annual average since 2016 is just now 3.2 percent growth of the remittances and that's not even including the negative growth last year so ibig sabihin okay um relying on the remittances ano na yan, no and then um, the government also over relied on business process outsourcing and even that has been slowing down from double digit again from 2010 to 2015 naging 4.4 percent na lang of 2016 to 2020. I would like to say that we have the same story with FDI despite nung um, rabid um, moves of the administration to open up the economy to foreign investment uh, either through different uh, amendments of uh, laws no like public services retail trade even the negative list of the foreign investment act and up to charter change but uh, FDI also has been slowing down since 2016. At yun yung, yun yung hindi, hindi in, ano sa atin, um, hindi kinukwento, but actually yun yung nakakabahala din. No? Sa isang gobyerno, nakaasa lang, 
dun sa foreign capital and also uh, on a dollar dependent economy. Um, I would like you to comment, Sunny, on the last, kumbaga, last uh, na pwede niyang asahan, which is the centerpiece program of the government, which is build, build, build. Um, not only in relation dun sa the dream versus the reality, <laughs> kasi ngayon nakikita natin the reality is 11 projects out of 112, yun pa lang yung tapos. Um, sabi natin, oh, what a shame, pero you know, the government has actually increased that number from 75 to 112 so that it can show a respectable number, no? But still, by the end of 2022, uh, mukhang 40 lang yung projects na matatapos. How do we look at that um, uh, infrastructure program? Um, siguro, before answering that, I think you raised an important point to clinch. And it actually answers, so why has the economy been slowing from uh, 2017 to 2019? It has been slowing, one, because we've been over-reliant on overseas remittances, which were slowing in that period, being about 3 to 4% in 2017 to 2019, 3 to 4% growth, compared to 5 to 8% in the years before that. So remittances were slowing. Secondly, we were over-reliant on foreign investment. Um, it was about, I think, 10.6, 10.7 billion in 2016. It felt mm -hmm. about 6.6, 6.7 billion yeah, near the yeah. end of that period. Third, yung pinagmahamalaki na BPOs, it's been flattening out um, for many reasons. Uh, the global slowdown, um, replacement by artificial intelligence or whatever. Um, so even BPOs have been falling. So despite... Um, all the efforts of the government to increase their infrastructure spending, to make up for the slowdown in remittances, the slowdown in foreign investment, and the slowdown in, um, in BPO investments, na only partially na compensated by POGOs, I think that's an important point to stress. Eh? Um, because if the government now is relying on build, build, build to save the economy, para magic bullet, it's so easy to look back on the 2017 to 2019 experience despite hugely increasing infrastructure spending, notwithstanding that uh, they didn't disperse lahat, the, the economy was still slowing, job generation was still weaker, even in construction. And I think that's the best way to answer why build, build, build is not going to be the solution for the huge crisis we're facing now. It didn't work in 2017, 2019, much less will it work right now from 2021 onwards. Uh, why won't it work? Well, lots of reasons, but I think the single biggest reason is that's not what the economy needs right now. What the economy needs right now is to put money in people's pockets. We're a 70% consumption-driven economy. If you're not putting money in people's pockets to drive consumption, that economy will keep on floundering. Does build, 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 put money in people's pockets? Well, maybe the few hundred thousand jobs it does create. But the thing is, we have like a 45, 46 million labor force. Um, you have most Filipinos not earning from construction. Build, build, build doesn't put money in most people's pockets. If anything, a lot of the build, build, build projects, especially the mga flagship projects, they're spent abroad. The biggest infrastructure projects, the flagship projects, like you know, the Mega Manila Subway, North South Railway, you import equipment machinery, materials, experts, contractors. So actually, build, build, build. It's intimidating. Sometimes workers, if it's a Chinese. <laughs> well, buti na lang, may lockdown on, on, on um, uh, importing workers right now. Pero yeah, tama ka. In previous years, we were even importing a few hundred Chinese workers kasi sila na nakooperate ng Chinese equipment which we were actually getting from them. So in the end, Build, build, build is stimulating the Japanese economy, the Chinese economy, and everyone else were buying all the materials from and importing the, the contractors from. It's not going to people's pockets. And ingay, if the government again doesn't accept, build, build, build didn't help in the last three years, you know, in its first three years, it doesn't accept that and it thinks it's going to help in our coming period, actually that's going to make the recovery drag on for even longer. It's going to make people's lives even worse. It's going to make the economy actually drag on in, in our you know, miserable state for, for, for many years to come. Not to mention, Sunny, I, 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 have you seen the latest list? Um, uh, I remember this administration was saying when it took over that 
it's uh, it, it, the state will invest in infrastructure, which was really a welcome relief from you know just uh, passing on to private corporations and the oligarchs in real estate the whole infrastructure development. Pero ngayon sabi no, the state will invest. But when you look at the new list, fifty six percent are all the loans. Tapos 32% ay unsolicited public-private partnerships. So still, no, the oligarchs still get their way. Unsolicited pa yun. They get to plan what they want to ano, to build. Tapos sila rin ang magpapatakbo nun. So it's really, we pay for this eventually. Actually, my thinking, which we don't have to answer right now, pa paano natin ito babayarin? And when, no? I I'm sure soon, because uh, right now we're getting it at a not even at a more expensive price because pandemia eh. and then next time even post pandemic we we're going to pay for a more expensive debt ano no servicing uh, and yet uh, yun yung pinagmamalaki no dami nating nagawa et cetera et cetera and let me add dun sa projected job generation sabi niya 1.7 million, that's the highest for this year. Ang magigenerate ng build, build, build. <laughs> 1.7 million, which is preposterous na yun, considering na yung annual average generation ng administration, which is the lowest across all administrations post martial law. Pre-pandemic ay 799,000 jobs lang yung kayang malikha no, ng economy. And then last year, we lost 2.6 million jobs. But you know, uh, the economic managers are saying, no, in build, build, build alone, we can build, uh, we can create 1.7 million jobs. So I think, ano na yun, medyo, I don't know what um, formula they're using, pero it's not really feasible anymore. Um, I hope you still share it, Jan. Um, mm. Again, hindi mo ako nakatanda, not as old as you, pero I really can't remember a time doing economic research that we've been we're being deceived so much by a sitting government. Kasi um, ever since the Marcus time, it's shocking what talagang infrastructure, eh, diba? It's nice to take a picture of that, the people who use it, na may kotse, halimbawa, or can afford the expensive rates. Natutuwa sila doon. So may para may enter fin rush ka with infrastructure projects. But the thing is, it's, parang, is it really helpful? And right now, in the middle of the pandemic, with so many people with such low incomes, it's a question of an opportunity cost ng funds. Eh. Um, so yeah, in general, we do need infrastructure. Ibang usapin pa if that infrastructure is the kind of infrastructure we need to help build Filipino agriculture and Filipino industry. Pero even setting that aside for the moment, mm. people are poor now. They're suffering. They're going hungry. So the opportunity cost of insisting on a 1.1 trillion infrastructure program in 2021 while not giving any ayuda, pahirapan pa yung ayuda, I think 23 billion pesos ang last count na, natin dun sa um, ayuda budget in the 2021 budget, yun ang cost niya. And it's, it goes beyond the, the, the financial cost or the economic cost of the, of the build build projects because there's such a need right now to support people's incomes with yung nga, 60% going hungry last year or Filipinos going hungry last year. That's actually a huge social cost of insisting on this Build, build, build thing. And I think that that actually carries over to yung feeling ko na big lie talaga. The government doesn't care for the people. But the thing is, the flip side of that answer, who do they care for? I think yeah. the reality uh, is, they care actually, for Actually, I, I was, uh, I was uh, yes, that's right. Ano ako kanina, sabi mo, um, trickle, down, trickle, trickle, down, down, trickle down, trickle down, trickle down. So I, I, I tried to recall, no? Well, um... Mas bata naman ako sa'yo, so I learned the real uh, meaning of trickle-down theory. So trickle-down theory in economics, ganito pala siya talaga, Sani. Ngayon ko lang lalaman, huwag kang tatawa. Trickle-down theory means that you have to relieve the rich and the corporations. That's a, that's a theory and it's an economic policy. So that magganahan sila to invest in larger causes like uh, job creation, magtayo ng pabrika, you know, make some infrastructure. And then now everyone will benefit. So there is a first step 
in the trickle down. Kasi lagi natin pinag-uusapan, hindi naman nag-trickle down yung mga ano ng gobyerno, you know, the projects, etc. People are, you know, people are, be, actually, be, under this administration, people bear that burden because of the regressive tax uh, taxation, di ba? Pero ang first step pala dyan, sa trickle-down theory is that you relieve the rich. So, when the government, Sunny, when the government, uh, the third government is saying, we've done everything to fix this economy and even to face the pandemic. I, I'm, I'm trying to think, how true is that? How true is that? Is it true with regard lang doon sa trickle-down theory? Because you've already mentioned. Um, you've already mentioned that um, it's really for uh, oligarchs' profits. It's for, for corporate profits. Parang nandun yung heart niya. When in fact, no, uh, ano rin, no, um, straight face sinasabi niya rin, I will do this because this will benefit everyone. Wow, how, how can we comment on that? But it's really so unjust. No? Masyado na siyang, um, masyado siyang harsh. Masyado siyang harsh. Um, well, una, siyempre na, just to give a number to the rushing up economics and the third administration, um, between 2015 and 2019, have the number here somewhere, the wealth of the richest 50 Filipinos increased from 3.3 trillion to 4.1 trillion pesos. So that's over that 2015 to 2019 pre pandemic period. Tadangin natin. Okay, I mean, a lot of that is like paper wealth from, you know, stock market valuation and all that. Pero ang tanong doon, with such a big increase in wealth, so nabanggit mo, so how much did actually the rich reinvest in the Philippine economy, in Philippine mm -hmm. agriculture, in Philippine industry? They didn't eh. So parang, even that whole notion of it will trickle down because the more wealth on top, the more they have to invest. So the reality is, they're actually not investing. And that's also how why the government has to admit, they're so desperate for foreign investment then. Kasi daw, they're bringing capital in. So it raised the question, with so much wealth and, in effect, investable funds in the Philippines, by, held by Filipinos, why doesn't the government do its job of reallocating those resources to, for instance, a wealth tax, and then do the investing for the, well, for the, for the country's oligarchs in infrastructure, in social services, in developing domestic agriculture, and in building Filipino industry. So, my policy choice, plan. and the policy choice was two things, not to touch the wealth of the rich, if anything, create the conditions for the rich to get richer. On the other hand, what you what they are spending on right now, like through build, 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 actually, it will primarily benefit the rich and their corporations in the same kind of real estate ventures they're doing right now. It will benefit foreign investors with the same kind of import-oriented, export-dependent enclaves they have right now in the special economic zones. So parang on two counts, policy choices, nag yung yung, yung yung government doon. And I think that's, you know, that's something that has to be addressed. It's a fundamental problem. Pero to zero in ano yung problem natin right now during the pandemic, well, the reality is the government can do so much more, but because it's so stuck in build, 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 infra a magic bullet, it's not spending on resolving our health problem in terms of either containing it better with, you know, better testing and tracing and all of that, but it's not actually even helping Filipinos who need actually the support for that. And I think, I know we have a slide, but I think it's worth looking at. Because mm. if you look at the extent of the problem we're facing right now in terms of how many Filipinos have been hospitalized, yeah, about 90, 95,000 Filipinos have been hospitalized because of COVID, the government through PhilHealth in its high, very high COVID package has helped less than 10,000. So I think that's one problem there in terms of the health. So iba pa sa ng containment yan. If we drill down to the figures, how how little we're testing, how bad contact tracing is. That's on the containment part. But even on the healthcare part, who lang yung binibigyan ng healthcare to Filipinos. Secondly, yung ayuda. At tagal lang nanawagan for ayuda. And if you have, again, through a lot of estimates, whether it's um, the DOSD's own estimates or even the um, Banco Central's estimates of homes without savings, by implication, mga isang kaya isang toka, the aid it gave under Bainin 1 and 2 was, was piddling naman. And it's refusing to give aid for now. At ang, ang worrying at worrying worry sa mga doon, it might be holding out to give aid para mas malapit na lang sa elections, sa pagbigay na ayuda to boost electoral prospects. Mm. 
terms of MSMEs, ang tami lip service na, oh, power ng MSMEs, the backbone of the economy. But the DTI is only reckoning almost 100,000 MSMEs have closed as of June 2021. Nearly half a million are under partial operations. But again, by the government's own estimates, how much did they give under the mga super hype na CARES, HEROES, travel na MSC support? Just 31,000. So parang, where is the help for the people in need? And if it's not giving what's needed to people in terms of butumisila, poor households, hungry households, it's not given to MCMEs who are now forced to close because of this interminable lockdown we're facing. Where's the money going? And the worst thing is, it's going to build, 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 and through the by extension, whatever possibly corrupt practices and good electoral watches of the many of candidates in 2022. Hmm. Sunny, um, let, let me interrupt a bit. Uh, we have comments from the audience. You have to wear an earphone because there's a loop in your audio. If you can find uh, right now. Anyway, just to uh, take off from what you're saying, um, there is very little ayuda. And in fact, I, I saw in the slide that there is even unused in the already little allocation for Ayuda from Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2. Hindi pa nila yan na, ano, no, na disperse or even na allocate, na obligate. Um, and, there, and then also two things of um, the lowang major factors, the toiling people who really need Ayuda, just uh, not only to boost consumption for for the economy, pero ano sila, really, they're um, in dire need of, of uh, social amelioration. Yung isa, yung MSMEs, and because they also compose about a million of the enterprises in the Philippines, so parang sila naman yung pinakamarami, pinakamahirap, um, and yet pinakakonti ng support, as also, um, and, and also with the workers having, you know, no savings to start with, and now, um, ang nire-report ng government is that, look, uh, three, ha three million households who lost their savings and we're saying, no, there are about almost 18 million who do not have savings to begin with. So, uh, andun na tayo, no, sa ganun tayo um, nakasadlak. And uh, we were, uh, we started this conversation by showing that, you know, the oligarchs and you were saying that they've even gained um in a year, uh, they have increased their net worth. Yun yung, uh, during the pandemic, the country's oligarchs who land in the Forbes list, for example, the 50 richest Filipinos, have even managed to increase their net worth. Kahit may pandemia, at yun nga yung sinasabi, when the, <laughs> when the going gets tough, you know, the, the, the finance of the um, rich it gets going, parang ganon. Um, Yun yung kumbaga parang gina juxtapose natin. I, 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 I saw this, um, this was end of last year, an Oxfam report saying that it will take nine months for the world's riches to recover their losses, if any, uh, in the pandemic, while it will take a decade for the world's poor majority to bounce back to pre pandemic level of living, if ever. So, Ang point kasi dito is, is not really parang napaka-natural lang kasi yun. Ako mayaman, ikaw kasi mahirap. But it's also because the government really um, is cushioning even no, the impact of the pandemic on the rich, on the oligarchs. And uh, that's not only through build, 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 but also through the policies. Yung tax cuts na binigay niya through CREATE and other um, pang, ano, ano, yung pang salvage or pang save ng corporations through the banks, uh, mga policies that uh, the FIST, for example, that's a, that's a policy, an act that's already been passed para lang isave yung mga in distress na corporations. And these are big corporations. Tapos, um, even in the CREATE, the government is saying, oh, look, uh, it will the MSMEs will also benefit. Uh, magiging 20% na lang yung dati niyang binabayaran na 30, etc., etc. But when you look at ilan yung magbe-benefit, Maybe the same figures as you've mentioned that about only thirty thousand plus MSMEs getting cheap uh, cheap loans from the ayuda, no? Ang konti non, That's really a drop in the bucket. Um, I think yun yung ane, no? If sinasabi niya, I'm fixing everything, 
ang that's a lie because fixing everything for the for the oligarchs yon at yun yung hinahabol talaga ng government at yun yung kanyang ipinapasa um, employment figures are showing na the toiling people are making do with whatever sort of job they find or create themselves or invent um, I think in, in the last siguro minutes a few minutes or so Sani my question is uh, Kasi ang tanong natin lagi, paano kaya nagsusurvive yung mga tao? How are people surviving? No? I mean, that makes us wonder na uh, ang galing din talaga ng Pilipinas. And you, you mentioned it, no? ang, ang formal, uh, informal self-employment is what we call dumidiskarte. No? Y y that's, that's really the street language for that, um, that technical term doon sa na-create na job in the last few months. No? dumidiskarte sila, gumagawa ng paraan. So, if people are surviving that way, alam natin that's really bad. It's really bad. And if things are so difficult, maybe uh, to discuss uh, somehow when we transition to the political um, analysis of, of, of things that are happening, if things are so difficult, where's the people's outrage in this regard? Uh, well, alam mo, it would be so nice if the government had actually spent some of its resources on knowing what the income of people is during the pandemic. But uh, again, struggling with whatever limited data we have from the labor force survey, again, completely trashed the notion that 2.2 million additional jobs in May 2021 from January 2020 is a good thing. The government made a big thing out of that. It's super untrue, talaga. Because if you have 1.6 million people added as self-employed without any paid employees, it's more than discarded. So it increased by 1.6 million, and it is so strange. Unpaid family workers increased by 932,000. Basically, you're looking at 1. Well, 2.6, 2.7 million people na falling into some really bad quality work. Um, mm -mm. So how are they surviving? Honestly, if, if we we're going to be basing on data, it's hard to say how they're surviving. Because if you look at the sectoral profiles, the biggest employment increases were in agriculture and in wholesale and retail trade. But these are still two sectors that contracted in the first quarter of 2021. So you bloated the shah to begin with by informality. Because of the pandemic, people had nowhere else to go. Nagsiksikan sila in agriculture and trade. But despite nagsiksikan sila doon, the sector still contracted. A contracting sector means less products, less output, less incomes for those within those sectors. So mm -hmm. in all honesty, I have no idea how people are surviving right now. Um, I think they're not. Um, that's why hunger is so high right now. That's why people are, you know, lining up by the tens of thousands of community pantries because they are having such extreme difficulty surviving. Tapos, yeah, siguro going back like, to, uh, as a counterpoint lang, and it's such a cliche to counterpoint yung um, the misery of the poorest versus the oligarchs. But, okay, grant na natin. In the last year, because of the pandemic, yung 10 richest Filipinos, may marginal cut sila sa wealth nila because the stock market fell. Parang, up 0 to 3% lamang wealth loss nila in 2020. But there are people like Manny Villar, whose wealth increased three or four times since 2015, before the pandemic, or um, Ramon Ang, whose wealth also increased two to three times before the pandemic. Of course, Dennis Uy, who was nowhere to be found in 2015 <laughs> dun sa top 50, bigla na lang pumasok sa eksena 2017, 2018. <laughs> Out of nowhere. These are people who actually are benefiting from the government's economic policies. And I think the worst thing for a lot of Filipinos should be, how are they making so much money? And I think to the extent that the bill, 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 which is, I think, 90 plus, 93, 94% transport related. Anyone 91, really, yeah, somehow. 91%. Anyone with a real estate development that knows where this transport infrastructure is going to be built, where the roads, bridges, or railways, of course, they're going to shoot wealth nila because they're, the land they own has suddenly become much, much more valuable. And I think mm -hmm. it's not far to think that very many of the administration's business cronies, business allies, 
are benefiting from build, build, build directly. It's not as contractors, kasi nga, baka nag import mo abroad. At least from the infrastructure, making their land values shoot up. And the government is not taxing any windfall gains sa property um, valuations now. Increase in property valuations of um, our, our, our big business now. Sunny, we're getting close to the question kasi nabanggit mo na yung, yung, ano, yung oligarch's wealth, eh, which mostly maliit na bagay but, you know, goes into the electoral war chest, di ba? <laughs> of, of a sitting or of everyone who would want to run for a president or vice president. Um, do you think, ako ha, tingin ko, dun sa mga diniscuss natin, is there, of course, I don't see any any candidate now clearly really taking on the side of how how yung people are um, surviving no yung impact talaga ng pandemic on them but um and then and, and also i haven't seen a clear platform uh, in that regard siguro ang tanong nang lang natin is ano yung importante for the next uh, president and vice president in terms of para siya ay uh, manalo no or or maybe to to put it bluntly, how important is popularity for the next president and vice president? Kasi uh, sa, sa mga nagdaang um, elections, nakita naman na natin na mm, mukhang kahit anong sabihin nila na plataforma, basta nandun na yung kanilang uh, winning streak or yung kanilang popularity, sila yung nananalo. So, how important is that for 2022? Uh, um, I think uh, the, the, the question is the tip of the iceberg of our um, huge problem in terms of our um, democratic backsliding. Um, I think the form of elections, you know, whether it's sa classroom voting for a class president or sa nation voting for the nation's president, unfortunately, the nature of the process it, it's, a, it's a popularity contest talaga. Um, pero sa akin, um, I think that just goes to show how deep our democratic crisis is that I think too many people right now are going to be choosing who they vote for, not necessarily because consistent sa kanilang personal beliefs or values or because of platform, but because they want to correct the backsliding, economic and political backsliding under the Duterte administration. And I think that's such a bad reflection of the kind of politics we have. It's, a, I think, a sign of how serious our political emergency is na our choice of leader right now is going to be determined not by who we think will be best but who we think will correct the backsliding and avert the continuity that the Duterte administration wants. Mm -hmm. Siguro, I think maganda rin yung tanong kasi it also highlights yung magnificent win ni President Duterte noong 2016. Um, PDP laban. Tama naman siya. Hindi exaggeration yung Hyperbolic naman na walang PDP laban for 100 years. But the reality was, <laughs> come 2016, there was no real political machinery to speak of. But Duterte, somehow, because of his manner, seeming authenticity, he did capture a lot of the Sibinatin sweep votes mm. and enough to just edge a win over yung, um, the other candidates. And I think that goes to show also na Unfortunately, popularity does seem so important right now. Um, political machinery is still important, but it seems na, especially for national positions, it's so vital now for that candidate to be popular, to be elected. And siguro, the next question sa atin doon, how do you set popularity? I mean, mahal yung popularity kasi it's supposed to be giving you the political capital to um, to reform things, eh, to reform the economy, mm. even to reform our politics. And, and think, people people like you. Oh, okay. and, it's, and it's important. I, I think it's, it's a, actually legitimate naman um, for a, a leader has to be popular to be able to push the reforms he or she wants. But mm -hmm. that popularity is used actually in a regressive manner to stop reforms or even worse, to regress the economy, it has, at, as has been happening under the third administration, I think that popularity is a double-edged sword. Uh, I think it's still important, unfortunately, more important now, maybe than three, four elections ago. But I think it is important then, sana to give the reforms we want. And I think, yeah. medyo sa akin nakakalungkot, um, even has a strong bias for really progressive economic policies, um, a, a, you know, democratic economy as a foundation of a more democratic polity. Pero nakakalungkot dito, 
those who seem to be the most legitimate candidates right now, um, we've been doing tracking about mga political platforms. None of them seem to have a track record actually in the sort of um, progressive social economic reforms na in advocate ng people for so long. And I think that's that might change, but <laughs> not this election, siguro. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Sunny, with that, um, in a, ano na rin tayo na prenup prompt. Pero it's okay. very, um, it's very fitting that we now um, we asked, uh, we have asked some of our friends from various sectors, no, about the changes they want to see. So I, I, I do agree sa sinabi mo na. Yeah, popularity really counts now kasi sobrang ano eh. Yun yung labanan din, especially in the 21st century, you have social media and everything. So parang ibang-iba talaga noong 60s or even when PDP laban was conceptualized or rose no from um, from democrat uh, yung parang nagkaroon ng democratic space and meron siyang mahaba rin kasaysayan dapat na siya ay uh, nag-propose uh, sana no ng mga platforms uh, for real change pero syempre di, hindi pa rin natin talaga nakikita yon uh, at this age pero um it's also nice to know that civil society or even uh, some ordinary citizens have mentioned that they still want to see the change you know that they've been fighting for or hoping for and that's still um, these these things still count as the as the um, the discussion platform in the coming elections or even in the coming uh, whatever uh, maybe people power events that we will wage ay ito pa rin talaga yung mahalaga sa kanila. So let's watch the video. Ano ang pagbabagong gusto mong makita? Isang pamamalakan na may pagpapahalaga sa dignidad ng lahat, pangangalaga sa mga mamamayang nasa laylayan ng lipunan, at pagrespeto sa karapatang pagtao. Ang gusto kong pagbabago na makita namin sa hinaharap ay isang mapagpalayang lipunan para sa mga kapatid nating lumad at malaya sa diskriminasyon at may pagrespeto sa karapatang pantao, karapatan ng mga katutubo, lalong-lalo na sa self-determination at right to education. Minang isang lesbianang pastor, napakahaba ng listahan ko ng mga pagbabagong nais kong makita. Andiyan na ang sanay decisive, intentional at systematic na cessation ng diskriminasyon laban sa mga kababaihan at LGBT. LGBT communities at matigil ang opresyon batay sa seksualidad. Sana yung mga malaking kayamanan ay hindi namamala. Kaya may napakalawag na intergenerational poverty ay dahil sa concentration ng intergenerational wealth. Tapos yung motivasyon natin, hindi para isecure yung ating mga kadugula o hindi magpanday ng lipunan na maanuhan para sa lahat. Ang nais na dili isang pangawa ay isang panghanaan na mapagkainya lalo na sa gitna ng pandemya at sa kuna. Isang pamahalaan na di panilintap, panarahas at kapas lang ang paraan ng pagunod. Sana ay magkaroon ng mas maraming oportunidad ng trabaho dito sa ating bansa na mapapantayin ang sahod ng mga OFW nang sa gayon ay bumalik na sila dito nilang magtrabaho at magbuhay ng normal kasama ang pamilya. At bilang isang ina, ang pagbabago ang gusto kong makita ay ang pagbaba ng presyo ng mga bilis. Nais nice namin Vicente ang trabaho sa lipunan na kumikinala sa karapatang opinion at lahat ng karapatan sa kabulang. Ang pagbabagong nais kong makita sa bansa natin ay ang pag-usbong ng mga polisiyang tunay na naglalayong matulungan ang mga magsasaka at mangingisda natin. Nais kong makakita naman ng panibagong anyo sa pamahalaan kung saan ang mga namumuno ay may hangarin na paunlarin at pataasin ang antas ng pamumuhay ng mga Pilipinong anak pawis. Also, sana systemic, decisive, at intentional change how the state implements its agrarian reform program. Sa mission field ko sa mga communities, ang mga baklang magsasaka ng mga kaibigan ko ay walang sinasakang sariling lupa. Sana meron na. I work as a chef and I deal with issues of food security and access and farmers not getting paid enough for their produce. All of these things need transparency and truth-telling by our government so that we can address the problems head-on and make meaningful solutions to them. Bilang guru at kumilista, ang gusto natin makikita ang pagbabago ay ang susunod po. Magkaroon ng sapat, kalidad, at accessible edukasyon sa mga mag-aaral. Ganun din po ipagkaroon nila ng sapat na gaheto o gadgets at internet connection. Napakinggan, yung matagandang pong karaingan ng kaguruhan sa usapin ng sahot, siyempre napakalag din po neto. Makamit natin yung edukasyon para sa Pilipino. 
ito po yung makabayan sa itipiko at makamasa. Isa po sa aking mga hiling na makita ang pagbabago ay ang pagkakaroon ng isang kalidad na edukasyon. Lalo na ngayong pandemya, marami po talagang mararamdamang kahirapan dito sa ating sistema ng edukasyon. Isa na rito ang inaccessible na pagkatuto, lalo na sa ilalim ng isang remote learning na setup. The change I want to see is one based on truth and transparency. We're in the middle of an education crisis, but our education leaders are refusing to acknowledge that and even denying that. And so we can't make meaningful change in that aspect. Bilang kabataan, maaari rin tayong maging susi ng mga positibong pagbabago na nais nating makita sa pamamahala ng ating gobyerno. Nais natin makita silang maging tunay na boses ng mga naaapi at walang kapangyarihan. Maglingkod sa mga tao ng buong puso. Walang hinihintay na kapalit, may integridad at may pananagutan. Maraming salamat po sa mga um, naging bahagi ng video. Ako ang gusto kong makita ang pagbabago yung ekonomiya para sa pangailangan ng mamamayan. Di ba, no, Sunny? Um, at this point, um, isa sa mga, one of the innovations we did sa Bird Talk is to invite um, uh, our media friends or one of our media friends. Maybe, Sunny, you can introduce him. Okay. Um, super happy to introduce who I think is one of the um, axis of sane and sound journalism in the Philippines. Um, Barnaby Law is an on-air correspondent with the China Global Television Network. Um, he reports for Al Jazeera and CBS News and also produces. Uh, he's the host of Love the Name, Now You Know, <laughs> uh, The Viewpoint, and also president of the Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines. Pero, if you forget all of that, ito sana don't forget this. Um, our sources say he's a voracious eater, drinks like a fish, and also has a fondness for, I had to Google this kasi hindi ako magaling ng Southeast Asian cuisine, has a fondness for Cambodian happy pizza, whatever that is, and oh also my God, saan galing eating yan? balut during military sieges like in Zamboanga. So, super happy to do Barn dito, otherwise known as Barn. Yes. Ang galing nyo Hi, ah. Barnes. Ang galing, ang galing nyo mag-research. Ano ba yung klasikot sa rin? What is happy pizza? What is that? I don't know that. Yeah, sino, ba mga, sino ba yung mga sources na yan? At saka ba't nyo naman ako tinawag na Axis? Parang <laughs> ano? <laughs> Ay, parang so there's Axis. Sorry. <laughs> masyadong ano, masyadong veterano. Yes. So, anyway, um, well, most of that is true. Yes. So, <laughs> I I am uh, I am uh, so just to reintroduce myself. So my name is Barnaby Low. You can call me Barnes. Um, I'm the current president president of the Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines (FOCAP), and I am a freelance foreign correspondent. That's why you know, Sunny mentioned all those different media organizations. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And of course, good, a good afternoon as well to everyone watching on Facebook. And if I'm not mistaken, on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I don't see the comments and I don't see um, if there are any questions there. But uh, hopefully um, our coordinators can type in some of the questions and comments uh, in our chat box so we can also read them. Uh, but uh, I myself uh, already, I have a lot of questions based on your discussion and based on of course um recent events and recent comments in the news um uh, honestly i don't I, I don't know where to start because uh you had such a uh lively informative discussion already uh but i think i'll i'll pick up on what you discussed last uh, which was uh election related and government performance related um Either of you can start answering this question, but um, you know you, we've seen survey after survey after survey this last week. You know, a satisfaction survey. Uh, President Duterte has an eighty-eight uh, percent, you know, um, satisfaction rating, um, and he is leading the vice presidential survey as well. His daughter is leading the presidential survey as well so 
parang sa akin, um, all of these point to a satisfaction among Filipino people with regards to the performance of the Duterte administration. And if you're saying, you've been saying that the, econom the economy has been performing so bad, and not just during this pandemic, but even before the pandemic. Pero hindi ba sinasabi natin lagi, um, if, it's, if it hits the gut, you know, if it's a gut issue, dyan na, that's when people get dissatisfied. That's when people start getting dissatisfied. But if you're saying that uh, it's the economy is so bad, and then the surveys are showing that people are satisfied with the, the with the Duterte government, how I mean, how do you explain that? Um, how can I start? Because I'm so agitated now from what parts <laughs> just said. I saw you <laughs> squirming. Okay. Um, okay, Sunny. Okay, I, I think surveys are great because they quantify things, eh? and there's this always this. Um, <clears throat> gloss of scientificness and precision from getting a number to like the second or third decimal place. But I think um, we have to accept that surveys aren't foolproof either. And I think there's one particular context under this administration um, that may or may not affect the survey results. Um, every survey, because even also the surveys, we get the full details of the respondent. Eh? That's part of your validity kung totoo bang may pinuntahan yung um, enumerators mo. Um, and I think it's so hard to, to not accept that when people are asked by a stranger who they are, where they, they know where they live, but then they're also asked, what do you think of the current administration? If the current administration, by its political practice, it's honestly the most violent and the most aggressive and deceitful administration in the post-Marcos era, I think it's not far to imagine that the survey is stumbling a bit in terms of getting um, honest results in terms of the satisfaction. Um, tapos, actually, even your um, the survey results about him being first as VP, it's actually not a big first a VP. Eh. Diba, medyo mababa rin actually yung, it's not like 99% want um, President Eight. Duterte as the next VP. Diba? 18. Man, Eight. actually. 18, 18. Diba? Yeah. So yeah. Because it's small, I think that's also, if anything, shows people don't actually aren't convinced that they should be president, even in that context. So parang, um, kami with Ibo, what, what Rosby and I were talking about earlier, these are actually more objective figures based on other surveys under people's objective conditions. And I think that stands on its own, whatever the more subjective surveys um, do say. Um, so I think, we're, kung, in a way, the question is, is there a disconnect between the survey results for satisfaction and their objective conditions? I think there is, but I also think that the surveys could be faltering right now precisely because of the kind of government we have. It's very violent. Mm -hmm. It has shown no remorse in attacking its political opponents, even on completely trumped up fabricated charges. Um, it has shown also an ability to deny aid to people who actually might need it if, they, if they're seen as opposition. And I think that that, that creates uh, an atmosphere where people might be inhibited from being as honest as they as they want. But you're not saying that the surveys are manipulated. I know, no. Um, it, it, that's even going to be hard, a harder sell to say they're manipulated. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I would hold on to the way they've been um, implemented. But again, I think the response is, I think it's hard not to accept that they're um, significantly um, tailored, not tailored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, tailored to the current political climate. Mm -hmm. Rosby, how, how do you feel about this disconnect? Uh, or uh, oh, yeah, actually, um, that's that, I, disconnect. Yes, I was going to react to the disconnect. I think because when when Barnes asked, na, oh, you were saying the economy is so bad, but look, um, yung satisfaction is uh, taas, ano? I mean, yung approval, yung approval sa kanya. Um, ang disconnect doon, which I. If if I th this is theorizing, pero if it's kung maprove ko ito, we we have deeper sociological problem. Ang disconnect doon is people when you ask them if the Duterte government responded to the pandemic um, in in a competent way, mababa yung yes nila. 
uh, I, I sorry, I forget which uh, survey outfit uh, came up it's with a, that already. ASEAN ASEAN survey, I think. Oh. Right, oh, yeah. sa, sa, yes. So, nag, ano siya, na, okay, uh, hindi sila na, natuwa sa kanya. But the disconnect now is that questioning is not necessarily related doon sa okay ba sa'yo na mag-VP siya or as VP si Sarah or whatever. Nag, ang disconnect, it can be in the respondent, hindi sa questioning. Which kaya ko sinabi na mas malaki yung problema natin because um, apparently the narrative nung... nung uh, Anong Malacanang itself, by distancing itself from the pandemic at kung paano ang lalalala ng ating kalagayan, is is uh, succeeding, no? Sabihin, um, kawawa naman ako, you know, I cry, I cry for you, wala na talaga ako magagawa, wala na talaga tayong pera, and then, and then that is really not connected doon sa, by the way, gusto ko pa uling maging presidente, and so, People are accepting it as, okay, sige, uh, this is not your fault, sige, mag-presidente ka pa. So, uh, hmm. if we, if, kung tama yung sinasabi ko, <laughs> mas malaki yung problema natin. Kasi parang, we still have, you know, uh, so much, so many things to do in terms of, um, hmm. you know, raising consciousness. Yung, yung, this is not your fault, actually, that's something that I've heard, uh, not just once or twice or thrice. This is something that I've heard from many Filipinos. You know, they say, well, you know, this pandemic is worldwide. It's mm -hmm. not as if, it's not as if, it's just the Philippines that is having this problem. And so there's really only so much that the government, President Duterte in particular, can do. And no. so, parang, they're much more forgiving because nga, this is a worldwide crisis. And uh, in fact, um, some of them would say, we're even doing better than developed countries. And this is, a, you know, this is a narrative that the government has played over and over again. Yeah. And I, I think this has, you know, um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think medyo pumasok na siya sa psych, mm -hmm. psychology ng uh, maraming mga Pilipino. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's the survey that's being manipulated, no? It's really yung, ano, yung social psychology. Yeah. Sunny? Uh, I have a quick comment. Kasi actually, I think that's such a key point. Eh. Um, because again, disconnect between the objective situation and the government's narrative. Um, the objective situation is the Philippines has the biggest economic contraction in East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. It has the highest unemployment. And even on... Um, rankings of COVID response, the Lowy, the Bloomberg, the CN survey, the Philippines ranks very poorly. So I think, again, those are more or less good objective indicators that the government response has objectively been among the worst, if not the worst, at least in ASEAN, but even beyond to the broader East and um, South Asian region. But I think it goes back to that same point. Eh? The government is... It's, it's, a, no, it's a populist demagogue running government with a huge propaganda machinery provided by the PCOO, the, the, the standard government propaganda machinery. And also, unfortunately, even this new development in the last 10 years of social media. So I think the disinformation exploits one. The disinformation campaign exploits how big the government machinery is, how much resources it has to spread disinformation. And secondly, I think important yung point, it's so hard to explain yeah, the pandemic is there, but the government could have done more. It's two sentences instead of it's a pandemic's fault. So easy to accept. And I think the ultimate foundation of the believability of the government narrative, we have to give credit, not, not credit, but we have to acknowledge President Duterte, nakukuhin ni loob ng mga tao eh. He gives him confidence, whether it's uh, sociologically, the tatay image, mabagsik pero mahal kayo, doing everything he can, or dial the masa image, hindi siya elite like you know, Aquino and Poe and Lenny Robredo. It could be that, that's foundation of that. But I think it's a combination of, yes, that does have that appeal. Secondly, the government is a huge disinformation machinery. And third, they are exploiting the pandemic actually to cover up for the problems even before the pandemic. And I'm pretty sure if the pandemic didn't happen, the economy would have continued its decline and he would have, would have had that smoke screen to say, na, it's not my fault of how miserable things are now. 
mm-hmm. unfortunately, the pandemic is but, but, helping him. But if Sarah Duterte does win, and President Duterte does win the vice presidency, I mean, what would you attribute that to, and what does that, what, what would that say about uh, our country? Um, well, ako, I think it goes to show how deep our democratic crisis is. Because um, if we have um, leaders who, in their political practice, whether as mayor or as president, are not actually caring for the people and are biased for the interests of a few, if they get an electoral mandate. I think that's a big problem, and it shows how, essentially, how much we've declined in the past years. Um, and I think it's a key point para sa akin don. We have to accept President Duterte does have that basic appeal. It may not be the 90% love him, but he does have a basic core appeal. But he has actually two things going for him in the 2022 elections. One, he has that appeal to begin with, no. But secondly, he has a much bigger political machine in him now than PDP Laban did in 2016. Secondly, he has a crisis and now the excuse to give aid in the run-up to the elections to improve the prospects of his successor. And I think mm. Biennium 3, it's double-edged. The people really need Biennium 3. The people really need aid because things have been so miserable the past year and a half. They also need vaccinations. But if these two things pick up near the end of the year, start of 2022, Unfortunately, that's going to work to the benefit of the of the incumbent, and I think mm-hmm. that's you know it's so I, sad. Yeah, or Ross B, I think uh, she wants to add something. No, actually, no, um, no. Uh, Sunny mentioned earlier, eh, yun na yun, yung disinformation. It's really you know um, unprecedented ngayon, eh, because of not just the media but also the use of social media and the use of information uh-huh. or the big inf- uh, big data from social media just to maintain its populism or yung kung ano yung anong gusto ng tao sige bigay natin and it's just you know gathering all the data from um, from our our personal information i mean um, a lot of um, demagogues across the world yun yung ipinanalo nila eh, before the pandemic eh, they use that but here um, it's also the use of ano yung yung lie, yung pagsisinungaling talaga. It's deception in the use of statistics, no, kung paano man loko yung administration, that's also unprecedented. Um, Ibon was established even during yung late, ano na, no, late years of martial law. We haven't seen something like this in terms of kung paano mag-sell ng mga wrong information yung gobyerno, or even yung statistics niya will have to be used in a different way, and Uh, we will be taught how to look at it in a different way, and then it looks it looks good, no? So mm-hmm. yun gagamitin yun. If if um, nothing else um, succeeds, eh, di siyempre nandun pa rin yung mga technical manipulation of the upcoming elections. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That <laughs> that is another <laughs> topic altogether. Uh, but I do want to pick up on uh, something that Sunny mentioned. Bayanihan three. Um, and so, ito, naka-file na ito sa Congress, if I'm not mistaken, since b- months ago pa, I think um, Congresswoman Stella Kimbo filed this along with uh, other Congress people, and it's also pending in, in the Senate. Pero hindi yata siya, and correct me if I'm wrong, hindi siya na certify as agent, uh, urgent by President Duterte. But now the economic managers are uh, sort of uh, changing their tune on this. Um, they're saying that they're more open now to a uh, Bayanihan 3, to a third stimulus um, bill. Is it too late? Or uh, do you feel like it would still be useful right now? And, you know, and if it still is useful, would it have had the same impact? Were it approved and implemented, uh, let's say, before the last surge or during that last surge that we had, as opposed to now that, uh, you know, cases are, well, I wouldn't say cases are declining. Actually, they're on the rise again right now. So just, you know, then and now. Uh, Well, I think things are so bad. Any additional effort in terms of um, the health response and the economic response, especially ayuda for families, support for MSMEs, things are so bad. Any additional support will be useful. Um, I think. To, I think that's 
that's that's that's unambiguous. Um, in terms of will it help address the problem of um, the, the economic scarring happening? It's too little, too late. Um, it's too little because um, we've we've seen at almost ten percent economic contraction in in twenty twenty. That's a lot to make up for. And a few hundred billion pesos right now. Um, one, it's being applied in the context of economic scarcity. We have so many people now unemployed, so many MSMEs closing, um, 10,000 with DTI's estimate, half a million partially operating. So actually, the problem was bigger because it wasn't done earlier. Um, so I think it is mm. too little to make any significant dent. Um, having said that, I think it will help the government's electoral prospects. And I'm not going to put it beyond economic managers because if they were sincere about their economic stimulus package, if they were sincere about wanting to help the economy with all the resources available to the government, mm -hmm. they would have had a much bigger stimulus package last year pa to prevent real scarring and to actually make recovery come faster. And our estimates right now, um, economic output will only go back to 2019 levels at the end of 2022. If you look at economic output per capita, it's not going to come back to 2019 levels until about 2023 or 2024. And I think the government is to blame for that because they didn't act when they should have acted. They're, not, they're just not doing enough even right now. Mm -hmm. Ross, we, should the government just pour its efforts on vaccination? I mean, <laughs> uh, we've heard, I mean, you know, we've, we've heard people say that is the key to economic recovery faster mm -hmm. vaccination um a faster path to herd immunity also means uh faster economic recovery mm -hmm. oh, um sabi ng government we need 82.5 billion pesos to buy yung 140 million doses yeah that may ganung ano ang department of finance but the budget in 2021 is just 2.5 billion and then the government is also saying, ah, there's, ano pa rin, um, we can get from Bayanihan to another 10 billion. So that means 70 billion will have to be borrowed by the government, which it intends to do. So, sa, ang, ano kasi, ang ironic kasi, um, the administration is just banking on vaccination. Wala siyang contact tra uh, testing, contact tracing, etc. So, mag, ano lang tayo, magbakuna, yan na lang ang uh, last hope natin. But even that, it's not pouring in, no? Funds uh, doon sa vaccination program. And in fact, ano talaga siya geared to borrow the rest of the 82.5 billion, yung 17, ang laki nun. Pero yun nga, kaya ako natawa sa question kasi while Sunny was speaking about yung uh, ipapasa na si Bayanihan 3, ako talaga jaded na rin siguro ako, no? After has so many elections we've witnessed, Na ah okay sige malapit na kasi ang election. But the other thing that's running in my in our minds right now actually in, during conversations then sa office is that the vaccination is even parang deliberately pinababagal no? so that it it stretches even up to the point of the campaign period where you see now the politicians um kumbaga oh eto nagbabakuna tayo so it's it's all a campaign opportunity. Uh, for for the administration, so parang added ano na naman sa kanya yon na. Okay, but you don't see it as a it. you don't see it as a supply problem. It is a supply problem. Oh, oh pero kasi when when we look at the the whole um, schedule ng ating mga neighboring countries in Asia, for example, we 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 were late no doon sa pag procure ng vaccines. Um, bakit? Because the the vac the um, the task force assigned to it no. Um, especially Secretary Galvez, meron siyang hindi inasikasong <laughs> procurement procedure. So, ibig sabihin, uh, as, as I said earlier, parang iba kasi naman yung kakayahan, yung skill sets nung ina-assign natin. When in fact, you could have been really more expedient, etc. Um, madali lang naman yun. You just uh, submit uh, certain proc procurement uh, papers and then makukuha mo, no? not just from COVAX, but also other donors. So we were late by three, um, about a month compared to our other, to other Asian countries. And, and that is, I cannot blame supply problem with that. Pare-pareho lang tayong nag-start na mag-procure, but uh, you know, medyo kulelat talaga tayo doon.
Mm-hmm. Sunny, ibabalik ko sa Bayanihan 3. Maybe vaccination uh, na rin. Uh, don't you think, kasi you were saying na this is, you think that this might be election related uh, because the elections are nearing and now they're considering giving ayuda to Filipinos for a uh, third round. But also, uh, this coincides, I think, with the negative outlook that has been given by Fitch. Don't you think it's uh, more a reaction to this assessment by Fitch rather than mm-hmm. election related? Or or maybe both? <clears throat> ah. What one thing I really do yeah. want to stress is how too little and how late it is. Because I think it's about a 401 billion peso um, by the hand three. Um, that 401 billion pesos is not even new spending. They want to realign from the existing 2021 budget and the previous 2020 budget. That's an important point because a stimulus package means spending additional on what you normally spend. I think that's so important because eh? if the government really did want to stimulate the Philippine economy in 2021, it has to accept the 10% increase in the budget this year from last year is not a stimulus package because it was had higher um, spending increases in previous years. So on an mm. aggregate scale, it is not a stimulus. Talaga. Um, why do we suspect it's election-related? Because it is about... If I recall from the news reports, because it's so hard to get any decent information sometimes from the government, they're planning about 216 billion pesos for cash subsidies. So that's mm-hmm. so that's going to help, guarantee that's going to help um, whoever going, is going to receive it. But that is something that should have, should have been spent last year or earlier this year. The timing is really suspect. Talaga. And I think yeah, it might be a combination of things. But will it help in terms of fixing the credit ratings or the, the outlook given by Fitch, it would because it's too small. Eh? 401 billion pesos realigned mm. from the existing budget is not going to stimulate the economy. If it doesn't stimulate the economy, it's not going to improve revenue generation, which is the only thing that credit rating agents actually want. They don't care about poverty. They don't care about unemployment. They care most about repaying of debts, yeah, credit rating agencies. Mm. 401 billion pesos realigned is not going to stimulate the economy or help with revenue generation down. So if that's the okay. motivation, uh, it's misguided. Ano, ano bang ibig sabihin yeah. ng negative outlook? Siguro, let's just uh, point out the basic of it uh, okay. to our audience. Okay. Um, kasi there are two <clears throat> elements of credit ratings. One is, um, is it investment grade or not? Your absolute figure niya, which determines how high or how low your interest rate is. So that's parang static yan. Anong rating ngayon? Outlook is expectation for the coming period. I'm pretty sure Fitch sees that the vaccination is slow, reopening the economy is slow, elections are coming up, and things are really heating up. They might see some political turmoil with um, greater political repression in the, in the period to come, more volatility. So I think their outlook is negative because they see that um, the economy is not building momentum. If anything, there are headwinds against it in terms of political volatility, in terms of, in all likelihood, a renewed surge because nga of um, the Delta variant amidst inability to actually test and contact trace and quarantine properly. Okay. Uh, Ross B., um, Sunny mentioned reopening the economy, you know. Um, how do you feel about how the government has been reopening the economy? Uh, because we've had like a, parang a stop and go of this uh, no, reopening the economy. So, uh, has it? Do you see it this being beneficial, or has it hurt the economy more? Um, actually, even in June, yung GCQ June of 2020. Yeah, uh, we've already seen that yung decision making yeah in terms of reopening um, is not is not even based on the advice of the Department of Health. Kasi uh, if you remember June yon, uh, paakyat ulit tayo no, on the on our second wave or or maybe first wave pa lang siya. So I, I um if, if we do recall, wala talagang usapan ng curve yon eh. <laughs> Kung nasaan yung curve flat ba or what? 
So then we already saw na yung dilemma niya, it's not just about um, has it done everything to address the pandemic. The dilemma really then was uh, yung profit, no? Yung economy that that's going that has been slowing down for three years, pero alam niyang sasad-sad. Um, come the, the GCQ siya. GCQ not not comparable to what we have right now kasi may restrictions pa siya noon. Ngayon, uh, medyo may easing restrictions. But uh, noong January na, we've seen it na pinagbabangga niya. No? It's, it's, um, uh, the government is making this false choice uh, between health and economy. So sinasabi niya na, health and economy, I'm so really confused, etc., etc. And we've been saying na, na it's, it's actually not a choice between the two because you can address both at the same time. Pero ang nangyari, nung nag-reopen na siya, it's because pareho na niyang hindi ma-address. Couldn't address the pandemic, couldn't arrest no, yung tuloy-tuloy na negative um, uh, negative growth rates at five quarters in a row. So, ang tingin namin, yung pag-open niya is not really scientific. It's not thinking, but it's just, sige, pindi na lang tayo kung maraming magkasakit, sorry na lang, but we really have to open now. And, um, and and yun, yun yung yung sinasabi namin na na um tuloy-tuloy pa rin sana dapat or hindi pa tuloy-tuloy ano dapat itaas talaga yung ayuda and at the same time a substantial economic stimulus and that's the only way we can say na kung gusto mong mag-recover by opening up that's the only way na you can address both you know but mm. the government is just you know addressing yung demands of business mm -hmm. sabi ni Ross B Sani um we can address both health and economy. But I've also heard a uh, uh, couple of economists say, dapat yung health muna yung isolve natin kasi susunod yung economy kung mapapababa natin yung cases. Do you agree with that? Pero yung, yung baba ng cases, gano ka baba din? Uh, you know, what is, this, what is that scorecard that um, should be the standard? Nakamute yata si Sunny. You're muted, Sun. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, siguro chronological lang. Of course, um, if the virus keeps spreading, if it's not contained by real testing, tracing, and smart quarantining, whatever economic measures, magkakalikages or minimize the effect because nga people are going to be afraid to go out and then the economy can't reopen. Um, so I think in terms of chronology, of course, you can address both at the same time, but it starts with containing the virus to begin with. That will also make any economic measures more effective and mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, avert any wastage from that. Um, what are our metrics, Sana, for, for containing? Well, I think it's clear the basic metric is dragging down the number of cases. Uh, because as long as the cases are Right now, they're plateauing on the, on the nationwide level, um, but they're still quite high in Bawa in Central Visayas, in, um, the Davao region. As mm -hmm. long as cases aren't really substantially going down and then plateauing at a low level, then I think there won't be any confidence for, for, um, you know, for the economy to reopen. And because, Sunny, uh, actually, uh, sorry, uh, sorry for yeah, butting yeah, in, yeah, but um, I just feel like. like it's okay na tayo sa 4,000 and 5,000. Um, because we've been there for many weeks, right? Okay. And then we're opening up the economy, easing up restrictions. So, ano ba dapat yung scorecard dyan? How low, how many cases ba dapat para masabi natin na, oh, okay, we're good. Okay. Kasi, <laughs> I think it's because we're so, we had this huge bump in cases early this year. Para naging acceptable na yung 4,000, 5,000. But we have to remember, in July and August last year, it got down to about 2,000 to 3,000. You named peak last year. So I think it's reasonable to expect, even though we, we seem to be able to live with yung 4,000, 5,000, buti na lang nag-improve na rin yung um, knowledge how to deal with cases. We have a lower death rate now. I think it's fair to expect, as a rule of thumb, at least be as low as the worst in 2020. Because right now, we're still double as the worst in 2020. So parang kung crude benchmark na, I think that's a good sign. Keep it at about mm. 2,000 because it was two to 3,000 
in July and August last year. So I think that's, a, mm-hmm. that's an important benchmark. But also, mm-hmm. it's not just about the case the cases. Eh. I think so to lang, I think even Fitch probably sees, because the ADB said naman, we have the weakest fiscal response in the region. Um, all the mga monetary measures na throwing money at businesses who aren't borrowing, loans aren't contracting, non-performing loans are increasing to 4%. I think it goes hand in hand. You contain the virus and then give businesses confidence to start doing business, especially mm-hmm. micro, small, and medium enterprises. But right now, you know, because nga the, the cases are still too high, because people know we don't have the containment measures in place, we're not testing enough, we're not tracing enough, mm-hmm. we're actually just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Eh. In all honesty, we've talked to some people from, I won't mention that, um, some epidemiologists, we're actually expecting sometime in August or September, once it's spread in Delta variant, because there's no way to test and trace the, the, the spread of the Delta variant properly, we're expect, actually they're expecting a spike near the second half mm. of the year. And I, I think okay. that's, that's so also why how, business confidence is so low right now. How, how bad would another lockdown be then? Uh, this is something that is in the realm of possibility. President Duterte himself has said that the government might reimpose restrictions. Mm-hmm. It's going to be Trust awful. Oh, okay. Sunny. Sunny. <laughs> that, that I think mm-hmm. we shouldn't forget talaga, because of this 16-month long lockdown with a periodic intensification, 10% of MSMEs have closed, half are actually floundering. These are MSMEs in, in the formal sector. It's not even counting so many other smaller enterprises that are in the informal sector and unemployment is high. So another lockdown is going to make them stumble even more and possibly, in all likelihood, increase the number of formal and informal MSMEs who are closed, which is, mm-hmm. I think, bad because mm-hmm. it's a consumption-driven economy. If you don't have the money coming in, if you don't have people spending, the economy flounders. Ay, mm-hmm. Last point. I think so important. Yes. Yes. OFWs. This is one mystery right now. OFWs contracted by less than 1% eh, um, last year. So it's a bit of a mystery because if you look at the GDP data, which measures um, OFWs earnings abroad, it collapsed in like by 30, 40%. Eh. Deployments actually also collapsed last year. So it's kind of a mystery now. So why are remittances this year still more or less steady with only a minor contraction despite huge drop in deployments last year, despite huge drop in OFWs earning abroad. And I think that might be because a lot of American families or migrants, Philippine Americans, are supporting. But it's a question of how long that can last. And I think that's, mm. that's another flashpoint we're facing. Kung dumating na sa hanggana ng emergency support from, from Phil Amps to their, their, their families here, that's going to take out an, an, a major leg for our consumption spending. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, we have about five minutes remaining. And I want to ask two things. Um, for my last two questions. You mentioned many times in your uh, discussion, oligarchy, but uh, the narrative that uh, this administration has been playing has been that uh, President Duterte has dismantled the oligarchy. So um, how, how do you feel about this? Um, has he? The previous. This, uh, uh, Rosby, the yes. Pre- the previous administration's oligarchy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't read it well. I've dismantled the previous. Uh, no, actually, uh, not just in the local media. I've, I've read this in the international media. And the observation that um, Duterte himself has created his own set of ol- oligarchs. And um, if, if you look at it, it's really, you know, the, the, the beneficiaries of build, build, build. So we now have, um, Sunny has already mentioned how much wealth they have, uh, how much they have increased their wealth, no? even during the pandemics, the likes of the Villar family. And it's really, I know, it's, um, it's so glaring that, for example, you have the richest Filipino, the Villar family, Manny Villar, and then the son is with the Department of Public Works and Highways, and then the wife is the highest, um, uh, the senator with the highest uh, assets, and then the um, you know the the daughter-in-law is in in government, which means yung DPWH na lang is really you know at the at the center of build, 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 and 
and we've already discussed earlier how that uh, program has only benefited infrastructure and real estate um, construction corporations and oligarchs. Um, I would like also to mention na yung, kaya ko sinabing, of the previous administration, yun yung na-dismantle because um, President Duterte has also been really blatant din siya, no? how, how um, he has allowed yung set of oligarchs niya to take over, for example, um, um, water concessions, concessionaires, no? Napalitan niya yung kung sino ang water concessionaires natin in, uh, in Maynila and in... in um, in Manila Water, yung mga owners niyan, so napalitan niya, by saying na, kayong mga oligarchs kayo, anak ko, you, you better shape up because I'm going to introduce my own set. Parang ganun yun. So, um, again, that's one of the lies that we have seen. Um, lumaki yung wealth nung sariling, nung nakapaligid sa kanya. No? It can be called the Duterte clique or maybe even uh, the Davao-based um, uh, inner circle we've seen uh, their income and their net worth really grow so much under the Duterte administration. Mm. Okay, real Ako quick, quick Sonny. Super quick seeing it. Kasi it's such a nonsense claim talaga with administration. Kasi if among the coalition, the administration coalition, you count um, the Nationalista Party and the NUP Party, um, NPC, with Oligarchs backing them, uh, Manny Villar, whose wealth increased uh, 68 to about 248 billion um, in, in, in the last five years, despite the pandemic. Um, we have, well, Ramon Ang and, and the Razons. This is going to be, or kundi man pa, this will be the machinery the administration will use to try and take the 2022 elections. So, beyond yung mga nabanggit ni Rosby, uh, they remain dominant in the economy. It's so crazy. They remain dominant in Philippine politics. So that's, that's again, huge um, um, image building by, by President Duterte. I know very successful, but also huge disinformation and part of the, the big lie he's promoting. Mm -hmm. Okay, real quick. Sorry, over time. Uh, yes, I just want to ask about Endo. Because uh, um, sinasabi ngayon na President Duterte is ready to sign it as an urgent bill for congress to approve but he, then he, he vetoed this in 2019 and what the presidential spokesperson harry rock has said today it's because labor groups opposed some provisions of that vetoed anti-endo bill so um do you feel that uh, this time around he will make good on this promise uh, and what would you like to see in this anti endo bill or law? You know, that's I think um, we yeah. have to look at how we have to look at how serious President Duterte is about helping workers. Um, again, the numbers will show he has the least wage hikes and the lowest wage hikes in the post Marcos era. Pareho lang silang dalawang wage hike ni President Estrada who didn't even finish his term. So even pre-COVID, the most important thing for workers, a wage increase, President Duterte had, has the worst record among all post marx administrations. I think that's important in setting the tone of how serious President Duterte is to be helping workers. Konti na lang in the formal sector is not even giving mm. um, what, what's he's supposed, what he can do quite easily in terms of nga yung, um, wage hikes. It happens every so often naman. What, what do we think with the ENDO bill? We don't know the latest version right now, but unfortunately, administration, past administrations have a record of using seemingly progressive legislation to actually justify anti-labor practices. So whether no Herrera law pato until now, or the regional wage boards, they've actually, a lot of them have given license to actually violate worker rights under the guise of supposedly protecting them. Um, I understand one of the opposition of labor groups to the end of bill was that it wasn't categorical. Now, all forms of contractualization shouldn't be given. Um, so the thing is, mm. if it's passed and it actually has, it's formulated legally in a way that allows certain forms of contractualization, it gives foggy points to administration, but in practice allows ENDO as a practice to continue. And para sa amin, the most basic thing we want to see in ENDO bill, it has to be clear and give a bias for the workers in the sense of having a 
as expansive a notion of contextualization as possible, ban it in all its forms, tapos give maybe binary exceptions sa lagang whatever, seasonality or whatever, pero kumbaga exceptions na lang yun. The rule should be ironclad in favor of workers. Mm-hmm. Rosby, you want to have the last word? Anda ako, bias lang ako, Barnes. Parang inisip ko lang. Sabi niya siguro, at tingin nga nung mga pinangako ko nung 2016. So, inisa-isa niyang ganon. Okay, I can I can live with this. Siguro, free irrigation. Oh, yan, nabola na natin sila even if, you know, there's no implementing rules. Free education. Oh, you look, UP has a lower, ano now, mga ganyan. Then, siguro sa endo, sabi niya, oh, endo, sige. Let's do a show na may endo bill ulit. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm just being by um, jaded. Pero siguro, um, that was 2016. Now it helps to look at our employment problem. Our employment problem is that there's a huge increase of, um, non-sal- of non-wage and salary workers or even of informal workers. And um, if ever, kung asabi mo, tinanong mo, anong gusto niyong makita dun sa endo bill? Actually, biglang naging limited tuloy yung vision ko sa kanya kasi ang laking bahagi, no? there's a huge portion of the labor of the employed na will not even be covered by what we call formality to be regularized because they are really in informal uh, employment and some of them self-employed, some of them part-time. No, You don't even know if next month they, have the, they still hold the job. So baka mas yun dapat yung harapin. If we're talking about labor, but if we're just talking about being, you know, really uh, mabango for the elections, then just going back to what the administration promised. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, I think that's uh, that's all the time Hello. that I have. <laughs> really? I have, uh... No wait, don't go yet. I think Sunny prepared a question for you just to, for us to let you go. <laughs> Can do we have the okay. time for that, Sunny? <laughs> Is that a happy pizza-related question? <laughs> <laughs> Google ko nila yung happy pizza. Uh, you know, Barnes, we're super curious kasi um, part of the populist demagoguery is really disinformation. Um, so one thing we're very curious to get your insight on, the administration will step up its disinformation campaign as elections near using social mm-hmm. media, but also in all likelihood using mass media. Winasak na ang ABC, mm-hmm. etc. So the pinaka question we want to get a sense of is, um, how far do you think mass media um, is um, buying into the disinformation or what are the possibilities for mass media to help combat disinformation as 2020 mm. I, I, you know, seriously speaking, you know, I, I wouldn't say that mass media is buying into the disinformation. Uh, I would say that um, during this pandemic, it has been very difficult for uh, traditional media to get critical information across mm-hmm. uh, because of the restrictions around the uh, mass media infrastructure right now. So <laughs> you have, you know, the biggest Philippine network getting shut down. And then you have all this space that's being used by the government and the government taking advantage as well of the pandemic, you know, us not being able to go to these press conferences and being able to ask questions impromptu you know it's not buying into the disinformation but it's just the uh, it's it's a disadvantage that we have right now because of the restrictions in this pandemic so for instance i, I think uh, this is not a, a secret naman ano um but there are many instances where we have to submit our questions in advance um, and we're not able to follow up with questions. Uh, this happens, uh, you know, not just in Malacanang press briefings, but this happens as well in other press briefings of other government agencies. So there's that difficulty. But we've also seen, um, you know, media push back. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have we have a Christian Esguera born out of this pandemic. Won't you agree with me, Deba? Right? Um, before the pandemic, you, you know, he had a morning show, but he wasn't, you know. Now people know him and people respect his brand of journalism. And I, I feel like um, we more of us need to be like uh, 
Christian Esquerra. I'm not saying he's the only one who's like that, you know, but um, he's gained prominence. Um, and this is something that uh, we should all be striving for, of course. Hindi ganun kadali because um, there's still this, uh, may, may, uh, I would say, um, you know, may fear. Eh? Um, there's this climate of fear uh, because if the government can do what it did to ABS-CBN, then it can also do it to smaller players. So when we, you know, when reporters uh, report on their stories, write their stories, meron at the back of their minds, maybe they're not aware of it, you know, but at the back of their minds, what's what's going to be the implication of this if I write this, mm -hmm. if I report it this way? So, may mga ganon. Um, but I see um, reporters, especially uh, in their individual capacities, uh, rather than the companies that they work for, really pushing back. Um, and really finding ways to be able to tell the truth. Mabuhay. Thank you. Thanks, Barnes. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Barnes. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, thank you as well. Okay. Bye -bye. Uh, have a good day, everyone. I'm going to Google Happy Pizza in a few minutes when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Cambodia. <laughs> Thanks, Barnes. Okay, um, I think at this point we entertain Sunny some questions of so burning yung mga um, lines natin. Um, maybe we can have the open forum. Yeah, yeah. Okay, from Maki Pulido of GMA News. Please expound with data that you have. Why did you say economy has been weakening even before pandemic hit? And there's another question. Did train law help increase take-home pay? Do you have a, a, power, a slide for that, Sunny? Um, can I request the, the slide about the GDP and GDP per capita in the job? Okay, kung wala. Um, I think on the headline figure of measuring the economy, GDP growth, the economy was slowing in every year before the pandemic, Ayan, from 7.1% mm -hmm. um, in 2016, we didn't count as Duterte because it's not the main job. From 7.1, it's 6.9, 6.3, and then 6.1. Uh, so I think that continuous slowdown by one percentage point is a huge factor in us saying that the economy was weakening. But also secondly, I think also very important, can we also please flash in some jobs? Naman? Um, economic growth was slowing for three consecutive years, but also job generation was weakening through that whole period of President Duterte. Um, walang numbers yan, but it's like annual average for about 477,000 um, during the Duterte administration compared to 600, it was much 800,000 um, in previous administrations. So on two key indicators, slowing growth, weakening job creation, those are huge signs of um, the economy weakening, even before the pandemic. Uh, the train law, I think, is very controversial, and it should be, because um, Rosli was talking about untruths. Up until, well, the, the, the pre and a briefing with economic managers, they were claiming the train law benefits 99% of households. That is such a brazen lie, because the train law did not increase any, um, did not give any tax benefits for the poorest, 75% of households, if anything, it increased the tax burden on the poorest 75% of Filipino families. It increased the tax burden because they raised consumption taxes, but unlike upper middle income and rich families, they had no compensatory um, income tax cuts to make up for the increased consumption taxes. So categorically, the train law increased the tax burden on the poorest 75% of Filipinos while giving benefits to the richest 25% including some families earning five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten million pesos per month. So, yes. And also, I think if we stratify the income classes, Sunny, about 48% of the families would have a 22,000 and below, tama ba ako? Or 30,000 yeah. pesos and below. So, uh, definitely... 22,000 pesos and below. Right. Also, so, Mm. Also want to stress, the train law took away the exemptions for minimum wage earners. Before the train law, all minimum wage earners, whatever that was pegged by law, would have been exempted from income tax. But the train law took that away, and by our estimate, 
in about at most 10 years' time, minimum wage earners will start to feel income tax cuts that they wouldn't have if the train law had not been passed. Right. Oo nga. And so then, income tax is not income and tax. then if you count, ah, yung from 48%, yung gitna, which, you know, the government um, nag illusion to call middle class. Yeah, they, they have, um, the, the question kasi is they had a higher take-home pay because of the of train, because of tax, uh, income tax cuts. But when they go to the to the market or to the grocery, the prices have really increased, and even even the middle so-called middle class are complaining that they have now fewer um, really pesos and even lower savings because of the train. Because it's too much pressure on bilihin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. If we answer that well. Okay, please comment on China's very strong GDP at 7.9% this first quarter under the fierce surges of COVID in so many countries here and there. Remember this health catastrophe emanated from China itself. It now becomes believable that this health menace is an instrument of China to catapult itself radically to stay ahead of the world economically. Um, okay, that's a question from Jose Maria Sanchez Palomiano. <laughs> okay. Um, ako personally, I, I, I right now cannot comment on um, whether the COVID was manufactured by China and spread mm. in the rest of the world to um, increase its relative advantage. Um, because again, pending any um, deeper research on that, but as good objectively, that is the case. Um, China, the COVID nineteen um, pandemic started in China, but China was also among the first to deal with the pandemic. And because it contained the virus very early on, that's the reason for its very rapid growth. Um, by the middle of last year, their economy was reopening and they started getting positive growth versus countries like um, the U.S., Japan, the European Union, who were struggling for many, many months until today um, with the virus. So objectively, yes, China did come out um, um, stronger in relative terms because of the pandemic, because of how well they treated it. But I think the lesson to be learned there is we should do all our best to contain the pandemic as early as mm, possible. That's um, right. That, mo, that's also where original city Yeah, that's right. right. Um, China was China even was hit, hit by the Asian, Asian. Uh, what is this? African swine fever uh, to the point of really um, importing, in, import siya ng pork, or rather, nag stop pa siya ng pag export. And I think that the lesson here is that. Um, well, well kumbaga, super invested no yung China dun sa talagang tinatawag niyang strength no economy. It really had a strong fundamentals in terms of of uh, even before you know opening up to the world, ay meron na talaga siyang uh, strong productive sectors. And uh, before the pandemic hit, China was already moving towards high tech sectors, and uh, admittedly even even uh, we were having the u.s trade war then we knew that china china um tumbaga, yung ano lang yung tahimik lang siya disimulado siya but you know it, it was winning the war in terms of of how, how much it was trying to invest in other um in the construction and infrastructure of other countries so meron siyang pagsisimulan and yeah, I think it's it's the government deciding right away and uh, accepting or oh, setting aside that it was really manufactured, that COVID was manufactured by China. Is set aside natin yun. We've seen how um, the the Beijing government has seen the pandemic squarely. Na sabi, oh, we have a problem, and this is going to be a pandemic. You know, because we're we're into trade, we can easily go to Italy because we're manufacturing uh, stuff for Italy. mga ganyan. They did something uh, right away. And like our government, of course, um, the first thing that, that the government denied is to stop, no, uh, to have a travel ban on people coming from China. So um, I, I'm, I'm not just sure about the 7.9% uh, so first quarter, I, uh, I haven't, um, hindi ko na catch dun sa question, is it first quarter or first half? Um, but that is really high. We, we have to check that because um, Chinese economy was also second slowing quarter, down even before. Quarter. Really? Ah, okay. Ah, for the second quarter. Yeah. Okay. And it, kumbaga, bounce back. Yan ang talagang recovery at even at even higher no, than recovery. Kasi before that, medyo nasa 2% na lang ang Chinese GDP. 
it was also slowing down um, for the past three years because of the slowdown then in global trade and investments. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anything else? From Socorro Luceño, Sani, why build, build, build? Question mark. At this time, <laughs> question mark. When the poor people have no food to eat. I, I think, and yeah, uh, that's that's a drama. And we've we've shown that irony. It's really that drama, how to phrase that question. Why? Uh, um, in the real world of Philippine policymaking, um, unfortunately, our economic managers are more biased towards the interests of a few and big corporations rather than the people. Um, if they had put the people foremost in mind, uh, they would have easily realigned a large part of the build, build, build as direct cash transfers and ayuda to avert yung hunger and um, worsening welfare. Uh, why build, build, build? Again, like the big lying and uh, prompted by Rosby, um, the government is not prioritizing the people. They're residual help when it's convenient for them to help. But at the end of the day, they have not changed with the bill, 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 because before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and even after, um, they are prioritizing the interests of big corporations and foreign investors. Build, build, build is giving immediate benefits to those um, selling the equipment, um, doing the contracting work. Build, build, build will also help the big businesses and help attract foreign investors. So I think that's um, not a very good answer to here, but I think that's the reality. Yung, ano, at this time, sabi pa niya, at this time when people, ako isang example yung, ano, yung jeepney, yung jeepney, oh, yung man. hindi binalek na no, yung pasada. Si Pinyo, nagpandemia, uh, hindi, wag na kayong bumalek, hindi, uh, hindi pinabalik yung mga jeepney drivers when the mass of workers who really needed to earn a living, walang masakyan. And yet, why? Because, you know, the government is selling the transportation modernization by importing new um, uh, uh, jeepneys or, you know, buses, etc., etc., And um, building that infrastructure to accommodate yung ganung classing transportation business. So it's, it's, it's so clear to see, well, people don't have trans uh, mass transport. No? Hindi sila makapasok sa, sa trabaho. Na, alam mo, sana yung isa ko pang nakita ngayon, the government is giving, uh, the MMDA is giving free ride. So mm. I, I just thought, kaya mo naman pala eh. You can have a public mass transport that's for everyone. But why are you doing this? It's it's a social experiment. Is it a social experiment? Is it because gusto mo lang na ma-ano yung appease yung, you know, yung kaguluhan for not finding uh, a, a transportation to go to work? So that you still can push for your build, build, build. Eventually, you know, imagine we're going to have subway of 32 kilometers lang subway. Parang magkano kayo pamasahe dyan? And, and according to the feasibility study, it's 500 pesos. The, the, yung full length no, of 32 kilometers. So yung parang uh, just to ano no to to uh, to kumbaga, emphasize yung irony nung tanong. Yes, yun yung itutulak niya because that's what benefits the. Uh, the um, private capital and um, other corporations involved in build, build, build. Pwede ako, ano? Quick, ano lang. Yeah. Um, Hinisana ko ng tulong from the questioner and everyone else. Um, I think we should ask the government that question and demand an answer. Um, they keep saying, build, 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 that's the biggest multiplier effect. Um, we've asked for a couple of months now for um, those government studies. Um, Baka kung iba magtanong or mas marami magtanong, maybe the government would be more forthcoming with sharing publicly that claim that build, build, build as the biggest multiplier. Um, so baka, mm -hmm. baka masagot ang ganong klaseng pag-aaral. But um, hindi pa kami nakakita, humingi kami, kasi saan iba maghingi rin. At kung meron na kayong makuha, kasi yan naman please sa iba. Okay. From Shen Maglinte, magandang hapon. Is it with Congress or Senate to force the executive branch to defer, build, 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 and push ayuda, which is very much needed with a growing hunger and employment? Actually, very much related to your request, Sunny, that there should be more public pressure, not just for information, no, but you know, to, for demanding answers. Um, uh, for short answer, <laughs> hindi. Because the government has Congress under his thumb. Um, so, lang, 
in principal babasahin natin mga policy books supposedly congress um, is the one that passes the budget kung pag-uusapan yung biennial three kung sinasabi na mag realign ng funds from the 2021 budget for cash assistance theoretically congress could be realigning from build 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 to ayud and everything else so latin ay theory lamang kasi in the real world of the philippines yung sinasabi ng presidente ang nasusundan um, so right now um lalo na with the elections approaching with a lot of re-election is siguro and other um, people wanting the favors of the president, um, it is very unlikely to expect uh, the, the, the theoretical possibility of Congress um, pushing the executive to do that. In the real world, it is up to the executive to decide to defer build, 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 and give a new time. Kung decide nila yon, mangyayari yon. Kung hindi nila decide yon, hindi yun mangyayari. Okay. Right, more questions. Salvation Dorado. What will happen to the amount that was not disbursed for the pandemic because the deadline has been exceeded? Where will it go? Extended. Well, <laughs> Nandun siya. Um, kailangan ng bagong batas to use it. Mm. Uh, so Binian 3 will certainly um, be using the savings as part of their realignments for whatever purpose. Okay. Okay. Next po, meron pa. From the studio, do we still have a question? Ako, I'll read a, a question that's been sent uh, by Alex Aquino sa Pinoy Weekly live stream. Sabi niya, do the Dutertes even believe in trickle down economics? <laughs> <laughs> Di ba? Tama siya. Or are there more mundane concerns involved here? Concerns that directly fatten. Oh, there it is, their pockets. Siguro ako, ako muna yung sasagot. Yeah, sige. Hindi <laughs> <laughs> mapigil ang tawa ko eh. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe I uh, I wasn't really very um, clear earlier when I said uh, may ganung theory in economics. Um, but, I, you know, hindi ko na binigyan ng context. That in, in neoclassical economics, they came up with different theories just, you know, para pagtakpan din what is happening really in, in classical, no, not just classical, in capitalism, no? and other and modern capitalism so isa sa mga even the international monetary fund was subscribing to this um in the early 1980s tapos tinigil na niya isa doon is yung sinasabi nila oh the benefits will trickle down pero ang sabi ko nga kanina what they did not uh, say or what what governments are not saying or our government is saying that the first step doon sa theory na yun in reality is to give tax cuts to the rich and to the corporations, which our government is doing now. So the question na naniniwala ba siya? Actually, baka ang, if I may rephrase the question, naniniwala ba siyang mag-trickle down? Well, actually, hindi. Kasi the theory itself has been used as a pretense no, ng, um, ng capitalism para, para masabi niyang makuha ng benefit ng rich mula doon sa it's it's a reverse ano eh, no it's not a redistribution of wealth but it's reverse getting the taxes from the poor uh, the poor pay for taxes the rich don't and then the rich uh, go into business at sinasabi ng theory oh maghintay kay John you will get your wages but that never happened yun yung tanong and uh, i appreciate the question yes that's what's happening and in fact Ano nga eh, no? lagi akong nare-remind doon sa kasabihan na yeah, capitalism or even in our case, neoliberalism is fascism in disguise. But in, in the case of the Duterte administration, it's not even in disguise anymore. Kinuha niya yung tax sa atin, binawasan niya sa mayaman, but it's, not, it's no longer coming back to us. Okay, Sunny Domingo Afable. Sa'yo to, Sunny. Based on an SWS poll in 2019, most Filipinos think it's dangerous to publish anything critical of the government. This could partly explain Duterte's high satisfaction rating. Ultimately, Duterte wouldn't be a populist if he actually wasn't popular. Oh, it's a comment that you can comment on. Uh, I think um, I'll draw then from a point that si Barnes said kanina. If even among journalists, mass media, who are very prominent, may nararamdaman silang climate of fear um, and maybe consciously or subconsciously self-censored in themselves. Just imagine if you are not a mass media um, personality, 
um, if you're an average citizen, mas maramdong yung climate of fear na yon. Um, and I think that's so important to to stress kasi a lot of the surveys and satisfaction ratings, um, I, I think they're um, subverted by the by this current climate of fear. Um, is Duterte popular kasi populist? Siyempre, hirap i-summarize yung 109 million na population natin. Um, I think there are um, a reasonably substantial percentage of the population who do love Duterte for whatever he is. Um, that's because nga, he comes across as very authentic, his messaging is good, um, nakuha niya love ng mga tao. But does that mean he's popular? Um, again, barring any scientific method to confirm extent of popularity. Ako, I think I have to be agnostic about that, but I don't believe he's that popular, in all honesty. Maria Lourdes, may we hear your concrete recommendation on government's immediate action to help more people cope with the economic effects of the pandemic? Immediate. Okay, I, 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 ako, I, ano lang. Again, a fast answer. We've been reiterating talaga yung, um, yung social amelioration. Ayuda. No? Ayuda that is substantial, that is, um, that is prolonged. No? Kasi medyo prolonged na yung, ano, yung lockdown. Um, and also an economic stimulus program that targets yung, the, um, the workers and the MSMEs and the farmers. Uh, so they can continue um, being productive or uh, producing no for for the economy so yun immediate yun parang aga agara no? um and i was going to ask you that earlier during the discussion sani yung fast fast and stop you know, let's let's do that game no what should be the fast policy and what should be the stop this policy kind of attitude and and the question i appreciate the question yun talaga yung pinakakagiat na action ngayon we were talking about earlier we were talking about mm, ano na medyo too little too late medyo ayun na patay na yung kabayo etc but um we still need no yung ganung pagbuhos ng funds to save yung hmm, tayo the majority of our um kababayan tani ako i think spend better spend more um, spend better, meaning um, move away from unproductive and uh, infrastructure spending that leaks abroad, like build, build, build. Put it in people's pockets through emergency cash assistance. Put it in distressed micro, small, and medium enterprises. So that's spending better, but also spending more. Um, alam ko napaka traumatic pakinggan yung 11.1 trillion peso na utang ng Philippine government, but actually. If it's debt spent on helping people and helping the economy recover faster, that actually is borrowing well spent. So I think we should spend more in terms of um, generating more debt through like monetizing the deficit. Essentially, you borrow from the central bank and then it more or less releases or prints money and then you can pay it I think that's an easy kind of debt, interest-free. And what you can government, um, not so much, a few hundred million pesos lang that you can do. But also, I think, um, generate resources by taxing the rich. Ilan beses na pinag-usapan yung naipon na wealth um, concentration among the richest Filipinos and also big corporations. I think taxing the rich more, taxing large corporations more, and then using that to spend more to stimulate the economy, I think it's a very good investment as well. You also say, yeah, <laughs> Typecast. How is the environmental situation figuring out in the analysis of whole economic prospects nationally, worldwide? Um, yeah, actually, we. Yung, <laughs> when we say the economy, yung pag sinabi natin the economy is really you know collapsing, we usually use the the. Siempre yun naman yung ano ano yung. Measure the metrics is the GDP, how much it grew, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we look back, um, not not in a long term basis, kahit medium term lang in the past five years, pag sinabi natin economy, of course number one jan is yung people are productive, people have jobs, etc. Pangalawa, the economy is producing what people needs. Pangatlo is that yung ating natural resources and ang environment 
environment natin or the ecology is supporting yung dalawa. Unfortunately, it's under the Duterte administration. Sobrang nag-deteriorate yung ecology natin because of plunder, because of um, yun, um, opening up uh, our natural resources to foreign investments and prioritizing infrastructure development that also... Um, Ano na rin, no? wawasakin niya yung, yung ecology. Yun yung priority, and, and that is at the expense of the environment. And I would just like to mention, for example, na in the opening up of, um, of uh, the economy to foreign investments through charter change, uh, one of the sectors, that, last na yun, no? last strands of, that is closed, supposed to be to foreign investment, is the public domain, which includes land, which includes... Um, other um, resources, mineral and land resources, even including yung coastal coastal resources or coastal development, or even reclaiming yung, ano yung tubig going land, etc. That's going to be opened up to 100% foreign ownership or foreign investment. And that's how bad it is. No? Na mismo yung environment natin is being subjected to 100% foreign investment. Yun. That's, uh, that's my take dun sa environment um sa atin. and in fact ah, sabi nung when we started this ah, um yung pag shift pag convert ng lands for example not just to non agricultural uses but even to corporate plantations have um unleashed no different pathogens na yun na yung kahit siguro ma survive natin yung iba't ibang mutants of coronavirus is we know that we're living in a very unhealthy environment Okay. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's time to overhaul. Um, Jenny Linares, even pre-pandemic, life is not good for the ordinary people. Okay, fact. What normal to go back to? Nothing. Overhaul the system. Change the leader. So it's not a question mark. It's a period. And um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a call. Kung maga pa hindi na ito wake up call sa atin. It's an action call. It's call to action. Na yung the the crisis that we're seeing, the health crisis, the economic crisis, and earlier Sunny was um, saying that we we really have this democ democracy crisis. No, na, um, that they would just you know we just look at it as a political crisis. You know, politics being how how people um, can have a voice in in the movement for change. Pero ngayon, even that voice is being ano, silenced. And even that space no, where we can move around and, and to voice out, uh, we want change is being um, constricted or being uh, wiped out through direct attacks, uh, not just uh, activists, but also the civil society. And I think uh, since the, um, the, the questioner, you know, the, the one who posed the question is not putting a question mark, but putting a period to it, um, Gusto ko siyang lagyan din ng exclamation point and that's really <laughs> mahusay na tanong at mahusay na panawagan. Ako, may add lang ako doon. Uh, I think the next elections are so critical uh, because if we want to change anything about the decline of our economic situation and our political situation, the Duterte administration has to be stopped in its tracks. Um, so I know um, marami nag, na problema about oh, kung sinong, sinong papalit sa kanya, anong pinaparindigan nila. Ako, I think, our challenge for 2022, um, things are so bad, things are declining so badly under the third administration. It wants continuity. Let's deny them that continuity. Kasi there's no point talking about change kung pareho pa rin yung um, leadership na makuha natin sa next elections. Um, will they be the best possible leaders? Yun nga, I think mm -hmm. yung depth and democratic crisis natin, unfortunately, I don't think that's the biggest question to ask now. As long as they are not the worst, let's settle for let's settle for something better than what we have right now. Um, I, I know that's unsatisfactory for a lot of people, but I think it's a political reality we're dealing with. Yeah. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay. Um... We're running out of time. Marami pa raw tanong according to our studio. But maybe we can entertain one or two more questions. 
So, yeah. Sunny, earlier you showed this uh, slide. Sayang, hindi natin masyadong natagalan. I know, I know the, the, ano, the, the message. Eh. Yung only Cory Aquino, I think. Um, yeah. Siya lang ang nagbasbas ng naging president. How is that? Diba usually you endorse someone, okay? Endorse. I anoint you, you're my next, ano. Is that Cory? On Ramos, no? So that was, that was it, no? Tama, siya lang, ano? The rest of the presidents, yung inanoint nila, <laughs> hindi yun yung nanalo. And um, I don't know, but, but are we seeing now a really a different trend where you see the president anointing the daughter and the daughter will win, no? So, uh, <laughs> sa, sa trend, yeah, ibang class. Uh, stay with the fact lang yun, but it's always incorrect naman to compare um, apples mm. with oranges. Eh. Um, I think the important point on is, um, unang una, um, yes, statement of fact, it's only Cory who was able to successfully choose her successor, um, the, the barely winning na, na president, um, Fidel Ramos. Um, all subsequent ones, well, si Gloria siguro, she endorsed herself, hello, Garcy, kanalalo siya noong 2004, pero all the others were either distant second or distant third. Um, pero statement of fact lang yon. Um, will things be any different with the current administration? Um, that I think that fact is important, not to say na um, hindi magtatagumpay, but also how we should look at the particular context. Um, right now, President Duterte has um, fortified the government machinery in his favor. He has made people anxious, looking for solutions. I believe he's setting himself up to be giving that solution through a last-minute flurry of emergency aid. Um, pero ano yun? Um, that's not by any means a foregone conclusion. Uh, I think yeah. the challenge nga sa atin dun is labanan natin yung um, disinformation administration, labanan natin yung siguradong pag-attack niya sa political opposition, uh, pag-demonize sa kanila. Um, we really have to work hard to deny the administration the continuity they're so desperate to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sani. At si, si Ramos was also invested already in the in the people power period. So medyo meron na siyang nai, ano. Okay, I think we're having, um, we have many questions, pero nagkakaroon tayo ng um, technical difficulty to translate the questions. And also we're running out of time. Um, at this point, siguro we, we, um, we just closed the forum. I, I, I hope... Um, we um, we imparted some kumbaga, thought na, na parang ano rin, no? pag-isipan natin. Uh, we have already overemphasized how the citizens, um, informed citizens can actually do something no? to change the situation, to, to change the crisis that we're in right now. And this has always been the belief of Ibon that information will really... Um, not just um, move us into action, but set us free from darkness that uh, we are experiencing right now. Um, and, and, and this closes our bird talk. Sunny, um, this month alone, no, ang dami nating nakitang mga nagpaalam sa atin, very important figures. For example, uh, the latest is Nanay Maming, no, the, the, ito yung pinaka, the beloved leader of the masses. Kumbaga, ako nga eh, kung sinasabi mo kanina na popularity, kung popularity lin lang, hindi ko pa inaaral yung plataforma, ay um, ipapanalo isang presidente. Tingin ko si Nanay Maming has that uh, X factor. No? Um, we also lost Nonay Espina, one of the fiercest journalists of our time. Um, and uh, of course, um, yung ating uh, people's artist, artista ng bayan, si Professor Neil Dolorican. And um, I, I give to Sunny no, yung, um, some words on Professor Neil because he was one of the members of our board of trustees. Uh, Sunny? Um, sige. I, I think uh, so much has been said uh, the last few days about si Professor Neil. Um, in particular, siguro, what I really want to stress, and siguro putting in the context of the current situation, um, I think in the exaggeration that you current political and electoral battles natin. Um, there really are historical forces at play. Um, si, si Professor Neil, 
in so many artworks over so many decades, reaching millions of people, literally. Um, I think he was very sharp in identifying who the biggest aggressors are um, affecting the city of the Filipino people. Um, of course, may soft spot kami kay Neil kasi, um, especially in the last few years, yung tumitingkad yung mga economic issues are sometimes very technical like train, tax reforms, and, and the like. Um, he was among the most sustained um, producers of editorial cartoons and images um, on those key social economic issues. Um, Sobra siyang mamimiss, I think, ng maraming tao, hindi na nang ibon. Um, pero ako, I, I'm a strong believer din talaga. The optimism Neil had about things changing. Actually, the reason we're facing such harsh um, political repression, the reason we're facing such um, big struggles right now, political and electoral struggles, is because there are historical forces at play. Um, Neil drew and um, illustrated about this in so many instances. Um, I think right now, we should take heart. Yung mahabang laban ni Professor Neil, it is still happening, and it is the reason why we have a populist authoritarian demagogue like Reza Duterte trying to stay in power at all costs. Uh, so sa akin, um, affirmation yun ng mga pinaglalaban ni Neil for very long. And I think also, doon ako nagkukuha ng um, inspiration sa guaranteed titinding laban natin in the months to come. Um, Neil was a big part of sa akin personally forming yung uh, role ng art and images in people's struggles. Um, hindi lang ako yun. I'm sure millions of have uh, feel the same way. Thank you, Sunny. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Neil, for inspiring artists. Um, you'll be glad to know that they are rising up right now. Thousands, hundreds of them are speaking up, speaking up in terms of yung visual nila, yung performance nila and their music. And, um, and it, it will inspire uh, generations of uh, people's artists. Sunny, we've reached the end. Thanks. <laughs> okay, um, this is the end. We'd like to thank our cross posters. There's, you, you see them there, Pinoy Weekly. Maraming salamat. Now you know um, Lapis and Seesaw Channel, Rappler, the Philippine Miserior Partnership. Uh, you, we can also see here PUP, CID, Alter Media, Kodao Productions, Bulatlat, FYT or Fight, and the UP School of Economics Student Council. Maraming salamat po at magkita-kita ulit tayo sa susunod na Bird Talk at iba pang events that we can hold online and hopefully uh, with physical appearance next time. Thank you. Lama. Government's total outstanding debt climbs to a new record high in what is now known as Bloody Sunday. Minimum wage is no longer appropriate. Ang ban sa pagbibigay ng bagong permit sa mga minahal. Bumaba ng 4.2% ang gross domestic product. Sa ikalawang araw ng panimigay ng ayuda, mahaba pa rin ang pila. This is among the least resilient economies worldwide amid the pandemic.